Synopsis, Dine Valiant is a frustrated gamer, but as one of the best special ops agents that the world has, his superiors and the government itself ensured that he won't be able to play video games because of his addictive tendencies, and so he lived and fought without ever being able to play beyond the nostalgic PS1 games. Fate was cruel as he finally meets his end after exacting revenge on those who killed his family, but on his dying moments, another dying man with strange magical powers appears, but unlike Dine, justice was not served for this man, he then offers Dine a chance to satisfy the greatest regret of his life via broken bar to play the video games he loved back when he was a kid, using the enigmatic god tier dart effect, the imaginarium bond. Dine is revived and sent to the world of cultivators where he must reach for the peak and challenge the gods of that world. And while the path of immortality and a second life was a great gift, Dine's joy was elsewhere. Within the Imaginarium Bond were three worlds that the mysterious man created with the last of his powers. These worlds were based on three PS1 classic games and are designed to help Dine in his path of cultivation. Soon. Dine will reach the cultivation world and fight the wicked kings, saints, devils, and gods that now control it. Soon, Dine will awaken the Genesis trees of Legaia. Soon he will conquer the many nations with his rune knights in the continent of Farsina. Soon he will be reborn as an endless to battle gods and dragons and slay the founding emperor of the vampire. Dine was deprived of gaming all his life, but now his life depends on his gaming. Witness the tales of Dine Valiant in his adventure as a nostalgic gamer in a cultivation world. Chapter 1 The Dine Valiant and the Betrayed Immortal. Dine Valiant limped as he walked. The floor behind him had a lot of blood. He was only able to move due to Shirul as the blood from him continued to drip. He had served the army and returned home a war hero, but the politics and corruption that caused the death of his family urged him to take matters into his own hands and live as a vigilante. The total body count of the enemies he killed numbered over 300, though he had been shot and would probably be unable to survive, he at least managed to claim vengeance at his father's death. The primary killer had been slain. His only regret was that he could not destroy the crime syndicate that killed his siblings and mother. I guess this is Ida Broken Bar he sighed. He slowly tried to stand up. The sirens could be heard in the distance, but this wasn't beneficial for Dine since the criminals had the police in their pockets. And while several good cops roamed the street, all the leaders had determined that Dine would be shot on sight. He slowly lifted his battered body and walk. Worst comes to worst, I'll just shoot myself. He mused. He walked out of the building and was staggering in his steps. Luckily the rain would wash away the blood that trickled down his body. He slowly staggered and walked deeper into the depths of the darkness. An odd sight befell him as a man with strange clothing was sitting out the corner with blood also appearing in his body. As Dine passed by him, he noticed that the man had wounds far worse than he had. At the end of the alley, he could see the cops already arriving. He glanced behind him and he could see that several unmarked cars had come on the other end. With the last remaining strength, he forced himself to jump down towards the strange man and sat next to him. The garbage bins and various barrels blocked them from sight. The two peacefully relaxed as their backs were supported by the wall. In an odd twist of faith, both were now seated together, and both were dying. It is a good day to die. Dine quoted one of the old school games he used to play as a kid. I guess you'll die ahead of me. What's your name, pal? Dine asked with a strange expression. Why aren't you going to a hospital? The memory I received from my master states that wounds like that could be treated at a hospital. The strange man frowned. Oh a broken bar ka broken bar Dine laughed. He was also surprised that despite the grave wounds, this man seemed to be further from death that Dine was. You must be some foreigner. Did you got caught in the crossfire of my fight? I'm sorry, but right now, I don't have a choice, wait a second. Dine then fiddled in his pocket and pressed a small detonator, boom. The floor several stories above exploded, suddenly, the police and the gang members who went inside the building, soon after, gunshots were heard, and it created a commotion as the gang, and the cops started to shoot each other, ah, the fitting end, with that. Both groups will start shooting each other. Dine laughed as his plan succeeded. You were saying? I see now that this world is not as easy as my master imparted on me. Going to a hospital should have doctors that would immediately kill you. Am I correct? 
Righto, I made a lot of enemies, I need to go to a hospital or back to my little lair to get patched up, but right now, I'm too wounded, and those cops will definitely kill me, and the hospitals would only let my enemies know where I am. Dine smiled. What are cops? Uh, the police? Ah, of course, now that term, I do know. I'm sorry, the memories I received from my master are somewhat limited, I both know of things and yet will fail in understanding the simplest of terms, for example, that word, I didn't know that those are the same, the man stated, what an odd conversation to have right before dying, but enough about me broken bar what about you, you have worse injuries than me, but you seem alright, these physical wounds mean nothing to me. The real threat is the poison in my soul. Much like your situation, I also fled from an adversary beyond my capacity. And like you, I am destined to die. Oh, bummer. The man then gave a strange look at dying. What offense has these men caused that they need to repay with their blood? I just wanted revenge. They killed my family and my old pop. My dad's a detective. He did everything in his power to protect this city. But corruption won in the end. I'm a soldier. So while I was sent off to war, I didn't know that things were getting bad here. After protecting my country, I went home only to find that the reason I wanted to protect my country was already killed. I see a broken bar the man gave a melancholic laugh. What about you? Dyn asked. I am a disciple of a rather powerful and influential person. She was the most powerful person in the place where I came from. Was? You mean she isn't anymore? Indeed. The same could be said about your situation. The greed of men and the desire for power was the reason that led to my master's downfall. It seems that your condition is worsening. The strange man then noticed. Dine's vision was getting blurrier and blurrier. It's alright. It's just how it is. I can't believe that I'll die ahead of you. Dine laughed. The man gazed at the rainy stars above as if considering something. Here, the man gave a strange red pill. Will I get out of Matrix if I eat this? Dine laughed. What? The man asked in confusion. Never mind. Dine took the pill and swallowed it. Almost instantly, Dine felt a strange sensation within him. What was that? I feel better. Dine turned to the man, but the man continued to look up. Dot. Dine was confused. Thank you for granting me this. The man sincerely spoke to the skies. Oh dot 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 K. You're not part of some strange cult are you number it's just that the sovereign of this world allowed me to have a companion to chat with as i fall into my death the strange man smiled oh so that pill can't save me it could give you enough time to head for the hospital or whichever adobe you prefer to hide and tend to your wounds erm thanks but i don't think it's possible now the cops and the syndicate that i just attacked are both here both will try to kill me so even if i can walk I'm still a dead man. That drug you gave me made me recover a lot of blood. But my wounds are still too critical. I guess that my destiny is indeed to die talking to a weirdo. What's is this weirdo that you address me as? A man with exquisite taste and uh. Language. Dine smiled. I see. Forgive me. I am someone who does not belong here. Do you have any alcohol with you? Number. A pity. I wanted to taste the alcohol that this world has. Then perhaps it would be wise that we drink mine. I originally prepared this for my own toast in the success. But I guess the best way to use this is to share it with another who has befallen the same fate as me. Suddenly, a bottle of wine appeared out of thin air and was hovering in the air. Dude, this is like magic. Dine was amazed. Two cups also appeared and settled on their hands. Bruh. I never took drugs because my dad really indoctrinated it on me, but dude. This is amazing. Dine laughed. It seems that the sovereign is very kind. To think he even let me do this. The man laughed. With all your tricks, can't you try to heal yourself? That is the one trick I am unable to perform. You see, the poison in me is basically incurable. On my desperate straits, I took all of the medicinal pills, herbs and fruits that my world has to offer the very best of them, and yet I am only able to prolong the agony for so long. I should have saved some for you. At least you'd survive. But alas, such is our fate. The man laughed. Welp, now that we have time, tell me more about your world. I belong to a world where gods exist, but not like the god presiding here. He's infinitely more powerful as he is a real god. As for our world, 
We were only humans like you who were granted abilities, accessories, and tools to become gods. Your god told us to ignore this world and this universe for that matter, but I was in such a desperate circumstance that I forced those godly artifacts to breach the dimensions and bring me here. The strange man sighed. Nice. I was hoping for something related to black magic. But a fantasy another world thing. That's also in my fave. Dine laughed. The strange man simply smiled. What a tale. So me. The dying valiant meets the betrayed immortal. So in this world of yours, you were some big shot god. Number. The title of god was bestowed to my master. She was given the task of ensuring that the world would remain in check. You see. She was to ensure that the various kingdoms of that world of ours would not use their powers to oppress the weaker. She had the power to destroy kingdoms with the artifacts that the god here bestowed on her. What artifact? The Imaginarium Bond. The man revealed a strange bracelet with several bright jewels. Chapter 2 The Mighty and the Mediocre. Nice bracelet. This is not an ordinary bracelet. This device has a great power that would shock your world. Instilled in this bracelet is the power of creation. It is similar to the power that the god here used to create the many worlds and dimensions. Dine's amused expression slowly turned strange. It was then he realized that the man before him was seriously talking. Is he insane? Dine wondered. All right, so you were forced to enter this world because you were chaste. But right before you reached this world, you got poisoned? Yes, right before I crossed the boundaries and barriers that divided both worlds, I was hit. Are your enemies refusing to chase you because of the god here? Number. They can't chase me. I used the energy in the Imaginarium bond to get here. I imploded one of the worlds of the Imaginarium and killed trillions and trillions to create that energy. I intended to recuperate here and return once I have sorted out all the weapons that my master has left me with. But I was poisoned. Oh, so you can't get your revenge now, kinda like me, I guess. Yes, my regret was that I wish I just used the Imaginarium bond and fought them, by imploding all the worlds. I would have killed a lot of them. The man gave a sad chuckle as tears filled his eyes. Dine paused in silence. He could tell the deep regrets of the man beside him. Dine took the alcohol and forced the strange lid off the bottle. Cheers. At least, they would never acquire those weapons of your master. Dine poured wine into their glasses. Dine went ahead and drank. The moment his lips touched the glass, an incredible taste that he couldn't understand surfaced. This is amazing. Dine reacted with a bewildered expression. Of course, this is known as the best wine in my world. The man raised his cup and then pointed to the heavens and drank. Dine was covering the glass so that the raindrops wouldn't contaminate the unusual mixture before him. Don't worry, a little rain won't change the deep taste of my drink. It is magical. After all, the man laughed. What of you, warrior? What are your regrets? You have yet to complete your revenge after all. Truth be told. That's not what I regret the most. I've always been a lazy kid, back when I was little. My dad made the greatest mistake of his life. Did he enrage someone he shouldn't have? Number. Dine shook his head as a very melancholic expression surfaced. Did he betray the covenant to his wife? What? No. Did he kill someone in power? Number. He bought me a PlayStation console. The man had a peculiar expression on his face. The memories my master bestowed upon me is very limited. I'm unaware of what that is. It's an old game in Consolia an ancient relic of the gaming era. I used to play a lot of games. It changed me when I was young. I got so addicted to it that I became antisocial and became a mediocre student. You are regretting being unable to play games? Yup. Truth be told, if I were to choose between becoming as strong as I am now or being mediocre, I'd pick becoming a mediocre student, you know, I just simply became average or below average, I'd only study just enough to pass, in the world that I am, you can't afford to become mediocre, the man chuckled, in this world, you can, but besides, I may be mediocre here, but in that world, I was amazing, Dine reminisced, that world, the strange man was stunned, in the world of those games, of course, of course, my dad tried all that he could to get me to stop gaming. He said that he made me an addict. That was why he made me take a path full of hardship and pushed me to serve in the military. So, that's how you became so mighty in this world? Yeah, I'm sure you have made your father proud. You destroyed his foes and brought them justice. 
This is a good way to die. I don't know about making my dad proud. I originally wanted to get my revenge and disappear. I dreamt of buying a lot of games and play the hell out of all of them. Dot. The man was stunned. You do realize that that plan could possibly be the worst way of honoring your father's memory. Hey, as I said, my dad realized his mistake and forced me to get into the military. If I killed those guys, I have to live a life for myself, and that means games. Man, the strange man laughed. His laugh was strong and loud. What irony. Here I am, regretting all my mistakes and how I should have used those times cultivating. And yet, next to me, is someone at least my equal in terms of the power relative to our own worlds. And your regret is you wanted to waste your time playing games? Oh fate. The regrets of two mighty men. One is that he wishes he was mightier. The other that he was mediocre. The strange man laughed again. Huh? So I'm your equal? Yes. If you were born in my world, you would have been like me given your talent and strength. I count 77 kills tonight. 286 within the past two days. That's how many kills you've accomplished. Am I correct? Dine was surprised. Whoa. How did you know? I count my kills because it's the only game I can play now. You got the number. Right. Such talent in this powerless world. I just can't understand how you would be so regretful of not being mediocre while I regret being mediocre. The man laughed. I get what you're saying. I don't regret not being able to accomplish my mission because I had already done my part. My dad's killer is dead. That organization is ruined. Of course, those that control this organization lives on. But to me, it's enough. I still dealt a huge blow to them. I just went above and beyond here and started to take action against the big boys. My cousin betrayed me, but I also killed him. Although I'm going to die, there's no one else in this world where I can honestly pin my anger. So why not wish for games? Is playing games really that fun? I pity that you didn't have the time. I only played a few games on PlayStation 1. Just PS1. Do you know what model has been released already? I would have had more than a decade worth of games and consoles to play. I wanted to catch up, but I can't, because I'm going to die. The strange man gave a loud laugh. What was that? One of the cops slowly entered the alley. The sound of the gunshots was growing wilder and even some grenade explosions were happening. The police were on the retreat, but the laughter of the strange man drew his attention. Dine frowned. He readied his gun and placed a silencer. No need to fight. Here, the strange man took out a strange charm, and it gave a bright purple glow. Suddenly, Dine could feel a peculiar wind enveloping him. He was stunned and glanced at the area around him. Various armed men passed by him, and some were even looking at their direction. Still, the group simply ignored it all and continued to move towards the area in front. It's the cops. A cry from the other end was heard as several gang members detected the approaching police and opened fire. Bullets were flying, but for some strange reason, even with the barrage of bullets, none would hit Dine and the funny man. A transparent green-like frame surrounded the two. It was then that Dine realized it was the figure in form of one of the large trash cans. But this one was bulletproof. Boha broken bar that's a broken bar. These are but the simplest artifacts that we have. Truthfully, I can do this myself if I wasn't poisoned. Our world has more powerful charms than this. By the way, the man smirked. Amazing. So you weren't lying. You're like Harry Potter combined with the Jedi and some Eastern cultivator story all mixed into one. If I had one of those small weapons, I could have finished my revenge. Dine was stunned. I would have happily aided you if we met a few minutes earlier. The man laughed. Oh, what if you gave me one of those charms? Maybe I can go and finish my enemies. I thought that isn't one of your regrets? It isn't, but it does make me uncomfortable. My dad always told me to finish what I started. It's not that I don't want to, but I can't. I told you, the god of this world is so strong. He could easily kill me and even kill all those enemies who chased me with a flick of his finger. His word is law. And he gave us a stern warning to avoid this place and even disallowed us to mingle with this in any way. That's why I was surprised that he left me alive when I gave you the blood replenishing pill. The strange man then began to drink. Oh, I get that part. But right now, isn't there a charm you just used? And isn't it protecting us? What exactly does our god want? 
The man immediately trembled and almost spat out the amazing wine he was drinking. The man was silent, and that had a strange look in his eyes. He then glanced at Dine with a peculiar expression. Although he had been very casual when talking to Dine, his expression now has dramatically changed. Dash. Chapter 3, A Chance to Play You are right, why am I dead yet? Is this Providence? The man pondered. Providence, what is your name? Warrior, I am Dine Valiant, son of Richer Valiant. Dine copied the man's way of talking. I am Strafe of the Four Elements, a disciple to the Weaver, the sovereign goddess of Alos Vasilis. It seems the sovereign of this universe has willed this meeting. I'm sorry, you do not understand how strict the instructions of the sovereign is. He will not tolerate any interference with this world. Our kings and gods, and the strongest warriors that have emerged in our world, have long known this place's existence, but even the slightest attempt would be met with severe punishment. And yet, now, I used a charm to save my life. Why would the sovereign want this? I don't know, because he willed us to meet. The world that I am from is falling into the darkness, just as this world is. But he allowed me to meet you to repay the sins of those in my world. You may have had too much to drink. Dine frowned. I am serious, Dine valiant. If you do not believe me, then allow me this. I will use my magic to look into your memories. Such an act is even prohibited in my world, so I'm sure it would be worse at this. Allow me this gamble. If I do succeed in casting the spell and am not smitten by the god that dwells here, then it is his will for me to send you to my world. Dine frowned. What the heck? I'm dying anyway. Dun shrugged his shoulders. Strafe bit his tongue to force himself to focus and move. His hands drew a strange seal, and his arms created a bright golden light. He placed his hands over Dine's forehead. It was then that Dine saw all his memories, as if it was being pulled up. Even the things that he had long forgotten emerged in his memories. Suddenly, it ended. Strafe's expression grew even paler, greenish veins appeared all over his body. Yet despite his weak state, he laughed as he hurriedly caused the bottle of wine to fly to his hand as he drowned it in his mouth. This god is just, this god is just, he laughed. Okay, you're alive, so I'm guessing that you are right, I am. And it's amazing, this world, this world is amazing. The imaginations, the stories, even those games you played were outstanding. I know, right? This is just perfect, you are the perfect candidate. You can enter my world. The fact that I'm alive proves that the god here will allow it. The man laughed as he drank another mouthful. What do you mean, perfect candidate? First of all, I finally understand your regret. Now that I've seen your memories, I can understand why you want to play more. You never even got to play a PlayStation 2 or an Xbox. I really wanted to, but the moment I got into the army, they knew that I was my dad's son. They made me take some special course, and I became one of the top soldiers and was sent again and again to go to war. At least you were able to replay those old games. I could play those games through phone and an emulator. But with how secretive my missions were, I couldn't even bring advanced cell phones that could emulate at least a PlayStation 2. And my dad told my superiors of my tendency to be addicted. My country couldn't afford to get me addicted and strictly monitored and made sure that I couldn't play. Dine cursed as he recalled his past. And so you went to anime to fill that void. But it wasn't enough. Strafe laughed. Of course, it wasn't enough. My superiors even offered drugs to keep me calm. But I always yearned to play. Can't a guy just play his games in peace? Strafe laughed. You're such a fool. Through your memories, I can gauge how strong and skilled you are as a soldier. You clearly are an aboriginal among mortals. No wonder your country made you go through strict training. You even completed an impossible mission so they can send you home for two years and still get paid. You plan to use those years to play, right? Just let me play enough games to get to PlayStation 3. That was all I was asking for. But those damned politicians killed my dad, and one of them is close to an army general in this region. It is quite a sad yet perfect tale. But listen, warrior, I have a way for you to play those games in your head in the highest definition possible. It will surpass any known consoles of this world and even the virtual realities that they are developing. You will get to go to my world and play a beloved game of yours. 
The drawback is that the game you will play will be one of those old PS1 games. I'm listening, now that I'm dying, I am feeling a bit nostalgic, Dine smirked, of the number of games that you have played in your memories. It's a good thing that you studied it in great detail. With the Imaginarium Bond, we can recreate the real world. In my world, we only used that power to create and harness energy from the souls of everyone living in that realm, like what you did when you sacrificed an entire world to be here. Do you really think that? Strafe shook his head in lamentation. The people of that world? Well for the great majority of them, I would say nearly 90% willingly gave their life when I used that energy. They were happy to sacrifice themselves for me, and this isn't due to some manipulation magic, they just want to. What? You can't be serious. They didn't have a choice. If I die, they will also die. The Imaginarium Bond is linked to the Wielder. If the Wielder dies, all the world dies with it. It originally belonged to my master, but right before she died, she transferred the ownership of all her artifacts to me. When I was about to die, it was they who willingly gave me their souls. Around 90% of the population in that mini world of mine gave their life and transferred it to me. As such, I didn't need to take the energy and their souls forcibly. Dine was stunned. My master loved that world. She remembered every single one of them and even made me remember their names when she gave it to me. It was only natural for those living in the Imaginarium Bond to sacrifice themselves for me. I am master's disciple and her only son. I'm sorry I made that careless comment. It is but a tragic past, but there is hope, although vengeance is in my heart. My real regret is leaving my world into their wicked hands. So, you want me to use the Imaginarium Bond and create a world of my own? Not exactly. You will do will be something totally different. Different? Why? Firstly, it is because you are human. I give you the Imaginarium Bond and send you to my world. You will be as you are, and in the world of cultivation, you will have to start as a mortal before embarking into the path of the immortals. Sounds Chinese. The Chinese were the ones who coined this term because right before your god forbid entry, many of our kind had visited that region in the distant past. That makes sense. So, I will be human. What will that imply? For one, you cannot harness the power and use the imaginarium bond energy as we can. Your cultivation level would be too low. Then how can I use it? You still can use it. Not just in the way we do. When I gazed into your memories, I realized something. You see, for people like me, we live in a world where everything is possible. We didn't live in limitations. We grew up knowing that if we cultivate hard enough, we can eventually do anything we want. But because of that, we lacked one thing that anybody in this world has. Wi-Fi. Erm dot 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 number. It is the ability that you have in using your imagination. So basically Wi-Fi. The point is, we were not capable of imagining great worlds and write great stories and tales that you call literature. We only aspired to be great because it was possible. But in this world, where reality is so limited, you have dreamed of amazing things. Games, animated shows, stories, and so on. Even the best literature of our world pales compared to yours in terms of imagination and creativity. So the power of believing trumps everything, including hate and injustice? Stop fooling around, Stray frowned. I'm just saying, what can our imagination do? While you can't harness the energy and use it as we can, you can do something else. You can live in a world that I will create using your memories. Do you understand? Because you have very detailed accounts of the nostalgic games you have long kept to heart, I can craft it and bestow it to you so you can enter that world and live in it as if you were a character of that game world. You earn and acquire the powers, the skills, even the items that exist in those games. Dine's sarcastic expression vanished, and it was as if his dead heart started to thump once more. There was finally a ray of hope in the dark storm that has covered his horizon all this year. So, you're saying, I can play those games? Chapter 4, The Perfect Inheritor Strafe knew that Dine would have this passionate reaction. Wait, if you guys can do that, why didn't you think of creating a world where artifacts and other cool stuff would exist? We didn't need to. You forget what level my master was at. She was a sovereign, although vastly incomparable to the sovereign of this realm. She was a sovereign that could easily create planets with her powers. She didn't need any time, artifacts, 
or charms. All she required was life force energy for the more powerful spells, so the imaginarium bond for people at our level was simply a tool to house life and draw life energy. If she wasn't betrayed trapped, no one could match her if she used the imaginarium bond. Did your master die because of her love for the world she created in the imaginarium bond? You could say that, but I would say number. When her enemies fought her, they always maintained a level that never required my master to use the energy in the imaginarium bond. My master's power alone could already kill them. My master died because of her own foolishness and the mercy she bestowed on her enemies. Dine kept quiet but had his disagreements with how Strafe presented her master. You may think she was not told to Macron V that she should have killed them anyway. It's not that simple. If she did that, it would have caused more problems. It's as complicated as the political scheme here in your world. Why do you think your leaders don't assassinate other problematic leaders of the country? I guess you have a point. All right, I think I get the gist, because I can't use the imaginarium bond as you guys can. You'll create a world using this world's awesome imagination, with worlds like the games in my memory. I have the opportunity to strengthen myself by acquiring the many artifacts, skills, and abilities in the game. Correct. However, there might be some minor changes in how the world's power is formed. Take, for example, one of the game series that you played. Let's use the Breath of Fire series, specifically Breath of Fire 3 and 4. As an example, that game has characters with a variety of abilities and the use of elements. Earth, fire, wind, frost, and so on. While the Imaginarium can create a world like that. You won't be able to learn those attacks. What? Why wouldn't I be able to learn those skills? Because of your limitation, you are but a normal human. Although the moment I use the Imaginarium Bond's magic to step into my world, the limitation of being humans will end, the laws will change, and you can finally step into the realms of cultivation. But as of now, you do not know how to become a cultivator. And if I make a world similar to Breath of Fire 4, You'd have to study the magics there to use it. But since you don't know, you can't have those powers. But won't that world teach us how to use those magics? Send me in as a baby or a young boy. I'd study it as I grow. Not possible. The moment I send you in, the magic that I use to speed up time in creating these worlds will end. I cannot explain it now. But I cannot do that. Besides, you are but a human. Your talent and even your bloodline towards the mastery of elements will be another factor. My talent? Bloodline. What kind of a lame game is that that I can only learn the basic attacks? And why is it that you look down on me because I'm human? Human lives matter. Allow me to finish. And I meant, compared to immortals, you lack a lot of traits that allow you to study magic. But suppose you find items of supreme elements in my world. In that case, you can naturally assimilate it with it and have the ability to master those elements. Dine was silent and frowned. Wait, so I have to work hard in your world to play? Yes, I've seen how much of a sloth you are and how addicted you became. I understand the woes of your father. Hence, I will naturally shape the worlds I will create that will require you to get some work done in my world. A broken bar so it's basically pay to win. Alright. But of all the games in my memories. Why did you pick Breath of Fire 4? What games do you plan to create? I plan to create three worlds for you. Breath of Fire 4, Legend of Legaia, and Brigandine. Dine was confused. There were several other games that he loved playing, although those three were at the top of his fantasies. There were a few more he would like to have a world made out of. Suikoden 1 and 2 were among his favorites. There were also the Final Fantasy PS1 generation games. What about the rest, like Xenogears, or Front Mission 3, or those in the Final Fantasy series? Why single out those three games? Can't you make a world like those games? I can. But those worlds are very limited in terms of strength. The former I mentioned fits and runs parallel with my world's strength, power, and growth. The other games like those you mentioned and the likes of Digimon 1 and 2, and Mega Man Legends. They cannot support you in that world. The way those worlds are designed is not suited for you to grow in strength and power. Man, you're such a cheapskate. Dine frowned. What about some in the Final Fantasy stories? FF7, 8, and 9 require me to create additional planets and create a space. 
it will cost more since I'd have to sacrifice items to build other planets. Those games I mentioned have a single world and has powers similar to the world I am in. That's why I didn't mention the Wild Arms series, Grandia, Lunar, and other games. Still, I am confident that the game will be to your liking. After all, I am offering you a chance to play the most immersive game in the entire world. I know you too well by looking at your memory. While the Imaginarium Bond can even create those anime shows you used to pass your time, I offered those games because I know you love playing above everything else. By giving you the carrot as the bait, you'll surely be forced to cultivate. Hey, just because you have read through memory doesn't mean you know me. You hated Aerith and wanted her dead because you've always wanted Tifa to end with Cloud. You hate the fact that Aerith takes a huge space in the heart of Cloud. Dine was stunned. He never ever admitted that. Not with all the Cloud Aerith shippers. Trust me when I say this. Dine Valiant. The game will be entertaining. It will be the most exciting game you will ever play. And if you aren't satisfied, here's a little secret. If you ever reach my master's level, you can create more worlds with the Imaginarium Bond. Wait a second. You mean, I can create more worlds? If you have the right materials and can wield the same power, then yes. If ever you reach my master's level, you would have naturally exacted vengeance and have already saved my world. So you get to play a few games at the start, but as you grow stronger, you can unlock more games to play and even build more worlds to your liking. How many games can I play immediately? One. Just one, of the three that I mentioned. Only one can help you at the start. The other two will surely lead to your death. Explain. I have decided to shape your world as follows. Legend of Leg AI will be the first world that I will create. This is because it's a world that can greatly help you in my own world. Those beings called the Rosaru can be likened to powerful sentient artifacts. If you can gain the acknowledgement of one of those Rosarus, you can gain a strong artifact that can help you. In fact, if you manage to awaken the same amount of Genesis trees in the game, that artifact would be on par with the strongest artifacts in my world. What do you mean by gain their acknowledgement? I am creating the world, and you can jump right in it. Unlike my master or me, you have no control over that world. You can only interact with it and take things that you acquire in game. So no cheats? I can give you a few advantages and cheats. But let's talk about that later. The second game you can choose to go with is Brigandine. That world full of monsters and the ability for these rune knights to tame and summon monsters can be similar to the monster taming clans in my world. And the last will be the Breath of Fire series? Yes, I saved this for last because the power of the gods in that story could be likened to the dragon clan in my world. And that clan stands as one of the most powerful clans in my world. Since you will be a mere mortal who is yet to start in the path of cultivation, these games will help you transition from one level of strength to another. Also, it should help you complete your severing. My severing? I am already circumcised. The man opened his mouth but didn't know what to say. He decided to ignore Dine's words. The cultivation world is generally divided into three phases. The first is the mortal stage, where you cultivate to enhance your martial prowess. This stage will generally be the stage in which the game Legend of Leg AI will help you cultivate. At the end of the mortal stage is the phase known as Mortal Severing Stage. In this stage, you cultivate to renew the three parts of your being, your body, soul, and mind. Alright, so basically, I undergo a complete makeover? Yes, but you see, it is almost impossible to accomplish mortal severing unless you have the backing of a stronger clan, family or have the inheritance of the gods. That game will help you accomplish it. I don't have time to explain everything now. Don't forget that I am dying here. So, warrior, number, gamer, what say you? Are there any more games? None. Cheapskate. It's not that I won't, but I cannot create any more think wouldn't i need materials and an energy source to create those games oh you mean you need to sacrifice something to make those worlds yes when our enemies betrayed us and my master died i received various inheritance from the heads of the god clans that served alongside my master they are all probably dead by now as they allowed me to escape they didn't want their inheritances to fall into the enemy so they entrusted everything to me the most powerful artifacts charms, 
holy fruits, everything, you'll be using all of those to create the worlds that I will be playing, yes, and the world that I will create can match those games and, at the same time, maximize the potential of all their inheritances. That is why I said you are the perfect person to inherit the imaginarium bond. Chapter 5, To Legaia, 1. Dine was pleased, being alive was always better, and his thoughts on being able to play the game in a very immersive experience is tempting. Oh, right, what happens if I die in game, you die, of course, right now, you do not have the cultivation to fully wield the imaginarium bond, at least not yet, then it's in hardcore mode, huh? It will be in extremely hardcore mode, after I create the world. I won't be able to make any changes after it, and I will intentionally make it difficult that even someone like you would find it very hard to survive. The battle around them had also stopped as most retreated, he could hear various gang members passing by and did their best to look for him. One had actually opened the illusory trash bin that Strafe had created, but upon opening it, the man simply frowned and moved away as if he saw nothing. Dyn glanced at the man but wasn't afraid since he was starting to be, whatever, it beats dying here, at least I can play a bit more, I'm game, I mean, it gives me another life, and this is sorta like high sky, which is also cool, Dyn just laughed, then shall we start, oh, right, what happens to you? I plan to become the artifact spirit of this imaginarium bond if the sovereign of this place allows me. I will basically be trapped in the item for a few years. At least, instead of dying, I can prolong my life just a bit longer to help you. Of course, my power will be very limited. I won't be able to do much and even save you if you fall into dangerous situations inside the game. I can only bring you in and out of the world and whatever items you can bring in. Does that mean that you're going to be my console? Strafe didn't know what to say. I guess you could say that. Strafe nodded his head though he was unsure of it. I have a few questions a broken bar the first world you will be creating will be Legend of Legaia, right? Yes. What is the exact process of you creating it? Will you simply create it to fit the plot of the game? It will be slightly different from that. It won't follow the game exactly as it is, but I believe it will be an improvement. How so? The method that I will use to create it involves sacrificing several god-tiered items that my master left behind. But I won't be creating the world characters immediately. Rather, I will create it from the very beginning. For example, in Leg Aya, I will create thousands and thousands of people to inhabit the human world and the Sarukai world and then allow the world to shape on its own. Oh, you can't create it at once? I cannot. Unless I want them to be mindless creatures, I have to create things from the beginning. The lives of everyone created there will be real lives, they are actual people, then wouldn't it change the world? What if people do stuff that will change the game? While certain changes can happen, I will set the fates of certain people and grant them the imaginarium bond's favor. This means everything you know of in the game will perfectly come to pass as the imaginarium bond will guide everyone's fates towards that direction, but apart from them. The other souls will have free reign, although the imaginarium bond will limit their destiny, they will still be able to do anything they want. For instance, in the world of Leg Aya, do not be surprised to see more towns and villages than what it was in the game. The size of the world in Leg Aya, after all, is large, and I will be maximizing it. It may take you years to fully explore even the Drake continent. Let me get this straight a broken bar there will be people who have free will in that world, and because of that, some things will sorta of change. But because of that fate guiding thing that the imaginarium bond possesses, it will still follow the main storyline. Yes, so if like a broken bar someone in Legaia wants to kill baby Vaughn, that person will fail because no matter how he tries, he won't ever succeed, correct. The imaginarium bond will continue these whispers of fate that will guide all the characters, be it the enemy or the possible allies, you have to follow it to what the game allows, but moving beyond that, it will change. For example, if you stay in Drake Continent for years, things in the future towns may change. For example, Octam would probably have been sunk by Zane. On the other hand, Things may change if you disrupt or interfere with the timeline by doing certain actions in the game. Like if I kill Zito on the first time that he appears in Rim Elm? That is one example. Therefore, if you stick to the same timeline of the game and follow the actions that the characters do, 
It will progress almost naturally as long as you keep moving forward. All right, I understand, but as you said, there might be more survivors who will find a way to escape the mist in the world of leg AI since there will be an untold number of people who will live in that world. This will also affect some parts of the game that you know, for instance, the items in the game can no longer be acquired easily. I expected that, if people can think freely, then there's no way people will leave precious items lying around the area. I guess if you try to do that and make fate leave treasure chest everywhere, it will eat up more energy as you would need to alter more fates to put those items on those specific places in the game, right? Correct. Of course, all items will exist in that world, so you may find some precious items here and there since the chaos of the mist would result in chaos. It just wouldn't be as easy as finding treasure chests in caves and such. Dine sighed. Ugh, that's annoying. I was hoping to get top powers immediately. You have the potential for greatness. I have seen it in your memory. But you must walk a harsh world to maximize that potential. If you have such powerful equipment early on, your path will be hindered, and you won't even make it to my strength. Yes, I will also add a few more Easter eggs. Easter eggs? You've looked quite a bit in my memories now that you know those terms. I had fun watching your memories, especially with your very dense reaction towards women. You really should change that. That girl who you like? She obviously liked you. Dine felt that he died at those words. He had been shot several times in the chest. But this time, that bullet was so strong that it even broke through the thick Kevlar armor that he wore. Please don't kill me broken bar Dine's expression paled, Strafe laughed, as for the easter eggs that I mentioned, you have to seek it out yourself, Strafe laughed, Dine had yet to recover from that painful attack, but he focused on the exciting game before him, sounds fun, then since you're going to go through the process of creating everything, I take it you have the ability to speed up time so that when I enter in the game, it will be right when the game starts, correct. It is among the other artifacts and tools that my master has bestowed, by my calculations, I will only need to speed up time and move it to about 1 or 2000 years to get to the part of the story. Can you create it so that I enter these stories earlier than when the game actually starts? Of course, Dine fell into deep contemplation, please hurry up in your planning, don't forget that I am dying. Strafe drank another mouthful, you said you could give me a few advantages, what exactly can you give me? The goal is to make you cultivate, as such, I cannot give you items that are powerful in the game, at most, I could craft some accessories for you that will aid you, thus, the overpowered accessories like the rainbow jewel, war soul, or the wonder amulet, and other late game equipments are out of the question, besides, to create such a fate for you to find it will make it harder for me. And honestly, if you bring those items from the game and into the real world, you'll be troubled to death. Unless you have the means to defend yourself, you will end up being robbed. That's true. Then what about the Rasaru? Wouldn't that item grant me trouble? Strafe smiled. The Rasaru are powerful living artifacts, but since they are sentient, they have a way to hide the power and make it look like they are simple accessories. I will intentionally make them acquire that ability. Of course, I really didn't need to. Going with how powerful these Rasarus are, it was very hard for the henchmen of the mist to sense and find them in the game. Meaning, it wasn't implied specifically, but these Rasarus have the ability to hide their power. Of course, you best tread with caution. Unless you can awaken 5 or so Genesis tree, you'd best hide that from saints. Like Saint John from the Bible? Dine tilted his head in confusion. No, those are, arg, those who have completed their mortal severing are what we call saints. They have powers so great that they can easily destroy a kingdom of mortals with the flip of their hands. Oh, you should clarify your terms. I'm still here on earth after all. Dine laughed. All right, then before you send me into the game, I have a few requests. Go on, don't send me in the game as the main character. Create the main character and do all that fate thingy to him. Just get me in the game. Dine smiled with a peculiar expression. Chapter 6 To Leg Aya. 2. What? Strafe was confused at Dine's request. Don't send me in as Vaughn. Dine repeated. Then who will I send you as? Your mother. Who else? Me. Of course. Who else? Definitely. Don't send me in as Noah. You won't go in as Vaughn. And you'll go as yourself. Then where will your starting point be? Rimelm. 
where else, do you plan to be a good guy in the game, yeah, what did you think I was doing, I thought you were planning to sign with the enemy, why would I do that, strafe didn't know what to say, why would I send you not as the main character, if that's the case, you won't get the raw Saru, meta, if my plans succeed, I won't need meta, Dyn smiled, Strafe was pondering for a bit, I can't think of how you could use being a person without any destiny to become a Rosaru user, how will you use that to your advantage, you guys really lack imagination, for people like you, you didn't need strong companions because you were already at the top, but as for me, if your world is as cruel as you say it is, and considering that you are about to die, I would need people who are as strong as Vaughn, Noah, and Gaela, with them. I would be more at ease, fine, if that's the case, I will increase the difficulty all the more, if you plan to have strong allies with you, I will also make it so that you can't survive without them, and they can't survive without you, the fate of Legaia is already grim, truthfully, the guiding fate of the imaginarium bond will disappear once you start each game, the guiding fate consumes energy, so I can't keep it up indefinitely, in Legaia. The moment you reach the time when the game actually starts, the Imaginarium Bond's control over fate will end, without you, those three are going to die, I'm fine with that, I'm still confident that I can complete it, though, I will surely be stronger than Vaughn, Noah, and Gaela, how will you accomplish that, won't it be better for you to watch and see, Strafe paused for a bit, then nodded, alright, this little gamble of yours has piqued my interest, if you manage to take advantage of this in the game, then I attribute it to your wisdom and ability, nice, now about the items that you will give me, I am requesting three, depends on what those items are, Strafe frowned, with Dine's memories as a basis, Strafe knew of certain items that quickly made Dine's life easy, if you are asking for any of the Rosaru eggs, Forget it, I won't be giving you those eggs, those items are too powerful, if I give you an egg now, it will create problems with the storyline, these eggs have to be hidden in the genesis trees, I won't be asking for those, geez, don't keep assuming things, alright, what do you want, armors, items, the point card, strafe began to ask, the first is the water key gate, in the game, it was used to close the river dam. It was supposed to be in the hands of the King of Drake Kingdom. Watergate? Strafe was confused. He knew what the Watergate was. That was a critical item that held no importance in the process of the game. Yep. Dine smiled mysteriously. A trace of excitement could be seen on his face. I can arrange that. But due to the workings of fate, you will begin not in Rim Elm but somewhere near Drake Castle. But why that item? Are you planning to get to Byron Monastery first? You'll see. Just let me play my game. Dine laughed. Fine, I'll give that to you. The next item is the Golden Compass. Dine listed. The Golden Compass? Are you just going to repeat everything that I am saying? You should know what the Golden Compass is. It's an item that allows me to ambush enemies easily. I understand. But you do realize that the items don't work exactly as it is in the game. The game uses a turn-based battle system, but you won't have that advantage in that world, it's all real time, that item will simply make it easy for you to sneak up to the enemy by giving you some form of cloaking, that sounds even better, Dine laughed, alright, then, I'll put it alongside with the merchant who you meet near the hunter springs, what's the third item, the third is the most important, if you can't give me this along with the two, I can make it that I won't need the golden compass, the item can be acquired a bit late game, after all, but it isn't powerful, the chicken king, the chicken king, strafe was surprised, number, the chicken queen, come on, man, quit repeating and start deliberating, is it possible or not, if it's the chicken king, I can craft an item like that, but its actual application within the game will grant you a burst of speed when running away, in my world, Powers can be created as long as the mindset and soul are right. So, this item will only work if you really intend to escape. But just like it is in-game, if you meet the bosses in the game, you won't be able to flee. I know, that sounds perfect. Strafe had a strange look. Remember, Golden Compass will help grant you a form of cloaking, which allows you to ambush enemies or avoid them. The Chicken King only works if you really have a desire to flee, if you have any desire to fight it again, it won't work, 
Are you sure it will just be this? Very sure. Dine smiled confidently. I can arrange the workings of fate for one to fall into the hands of the merchant and allow you to acquire this item. Then that's that. What about the other games? It is best that we talk about it next time. Since I will merge my spirit into this item and bony myself to it, we can talk about it more later. For now, we begin our journey. Wait, I still have one more request. Strafe was about to refute. But then he realized that Dine's previous request wasn't anything over the top. What is it? Send me in. Two. No. Three years before the game starts. Three years? But that's not logical. You won't acquire the raw Saru then. Vaughn has to grow up yet. And Meta would not have hatched from his egg yet. It will only be during the time that Zito attacks that you'll get the opportunity to have a Rosaru. I know, I have my plans. Then that can easily be granted. Are there any more requests? None. Go ahead and beam me up, Struffy. Strafe shook his head and laughed. Looks like it will be an interesting year. Let's go. Strafe raised his hands, and the Imaginarium Bond gave a light glow. At that moment, Strafe appeared in the world within the Imaginarium Bond. Below him was a city with hundreds of people releasing their energy. Dine was right next to him in the air. Where am I? In the last remaining world of the Imaginarium Bond, Strafe gave a soft sigh. The last world? Yes, this is rather young world. Haven't you asked yourself why we didn't use any means to speed up the time in the worlds within the Bonds to increase its population and strength? Number. There are several reasons. The first is that it requires a lot of energy. In fact, to speed up time, we would require to sacrifice people in our world to increase the time in the worlds of the Imaginarium Bond. And the more people in these worlds, the more energy is required. Basically, the amount of energy you need to waste will increase as the world's population grows. So obviously, my master wouldn't dare do that. Life energy is the only energy that can speed up time. After all, they give up the time of their life as energy for us to use. Dine was startled. As Strafe slowly descended, the crowds below all knelt down obediently. Many of them were crying. You have heard our discussion, and you know of my plans. My life is nearing its end, and the only hope that we have is this person. The god in this world is far, far stronger than the gods in my world. And yet, he allowed me to meet this young man and have hope for the future. Hail Dine the hope of our master. The crowds chorused together that it was so strong. Why are you bringing me here? Dine wondered. Because although you will be playing, I want you to remember just what was sacrificed for you. Strafe suddenly raised his hands as several items were began to appear one after the other. Several strange artifacts could be seen a towering sword, a large heart, a large bright red stone that glowed like the sun. More and more objects appeared. This should be enough. Strafe whispered, I still need to prepare some items for you. After all, Strafe laughed as he glanced at Dine and called his attention. The bright objects suddenly had no effect on Dine's eyes. Dine, this is the youngest world my master has. Its population is simply a little over a trillion. I will use some of the energy to breach the dimensional separators between this world and mine. The rest of the energy will be used to create leg AI and sacrifice these various god-tiered artifacts to make that world and prepare the other worlds for the future. Remember their sacrifice. Engrave it all to memory. Strafe smiled. Suddenly, a strange series of memories flashed before Dine's eyes. It was as if he knew everyone's names in the crowd below and even the other people in this world. He glanced below in shock and couldn't help but trembled. The crowd below had no hatred in their eyes. They were already doomed to die once Strafe dies. So it was a good thing that they could die for that would give their master hope. Whoa wait. Dine hesitated. Do not worry, Dine. They don't blame you, and neither do I. Nor am I doing this to guilt trip you. This is necessary. You will be their hope. When I reach this plane, I would lose my body and die eventually. I only have a little over a year to live. They will die with me. But now, you will be the owner, and you will be their hope. Citizens of Elpida, give your greetings to the hope of my world. Strafe made his grand announcement. We greet you, Dine Valiant, the hope of Los Vazilis. May you enjoy the game we make. May you grant peace to our two masters, and may you live forever. The entire world shook as every citizen shouted with a great cheer. It was a cheer of great rejoicing. It was a cheer of great hope. 
It was a cheer that broke the heart of Dine as he watched helplessly. Citizens of Elpida, you will not be forgotten. Live on in the world that will cause this valiant the power he needs to overcome the devils that plague Delos Vasilis. Strafe's eyes began to tear up, and then Strafe shut his eyes. Dine's vision grew dark, as well. Chapter 7 Understanding Legaia 1. Dine woke up on the shores of the beach. The crashing waves woke him, and he immediately began to move. He realized that his body was no longer wounded. He wore the same outfit that he had from last night. Dine slowly moved away from the waters and walked towards the sand. He wiped the water from his eyes. Whether it was the water from the beach or the tears in his eyes, he only knew. Really? You took away my gun? Where am I? He looked around and he could see several trees sprouting at the end of the beach, and a vast plain land with thick mist was just beyond the beach where he was. That really took a toll from me. I am about to fall asleep. You are in Leg Aya. Your game begins. The voice trailed off and disappeared. Dine wanted to complain but knew that Strafe needed to rest. One year to live? And I thought I'd have this talking console forever. Dine frowned. He understood that going by the words that Strafe made right before he made this world, he would still die within a year. I have to go. Dine immediately began to move. Wait, where are the items? Dine cursed. He then checked on his pockets and clothes and realized that the three items were not with him. Oh, right. It will be left to a person fated to have it. Dine recalled and began to move. He remembered that fate's workings would be shaped so that someone nearby would have the items that Dine needs. As he marched further, he noticed a thick mist in the distance. Right. The winds of the ocean blow against the mist. Dine realized why he was brought here as a starting point. This means that that fated person to have those three items should be around. Dine immediately began to look around. He moved closer to the jungle but was wary of the mist. I need to get out of here before it gets dark. It looks like it's about 8 in the morning, Dine concluded. He moved forward and noticed that there was a dead body on the ground. The dead man wore a red cap and a purple vest, which strangely familiar to Dine. Is this a merchant? Dine wondered. It was then he recalled a particular named character in Legend of Leg Aya, Lezem. Is this Lezem? Shouldn't he be alive? Dune pondered for a bit but immediately ransacked the man's body. The first thing he found was a strange key. It had a strange symbol that looked like a drop of water. The water key. Dine cried excitedly. He then proceeded to check the other items around the man and found a golden compass. Obviously, this is the golden compass. But how does it work? Dine frowned as he gave the compass a few squeezes. Ah, I'll figure this out later. Come on. Chicken King. Dine prayed for the item to appear, and checked on the other pocket but found only a strange purple card. Wonder what this purple card is for? Could it be for gold like in those cultivation stories I read? Wait, where's the Chicken King? Dine almost fell to dismay but then realized something. He checked on the man's neck, and sure enough, there was a necklace attached to him with the symbol of a rooster with a crown. Chicken King? Dine guessed. Well, at least I have the items. Dine smiled. Now, to get to Rim Elm. Dine glanced up and looked around. He noticed that there was a mountain that blocked his view on both sides of the beach. Wait, I know this. Dine realized that his knowledge and memory about Legend of Leg Aia was very clear. He could even recall the world map of the Drake continent. Two mountains by the beach. A merchant that has an outfit like Lezem. If this is Lezem then I must be somewhere between the Hunter Spring and Rim Elm, Dine recalled in his memories. All right, Dine calms down, Dine said to himself and took out the golden compass and kept holding on to it. His other hand grasped on the Chicken King, which he wore on his neck. It was then that strange energy moved around him, a sense of understanding also surfaced. All right, then it's that easy to activate, I just need to hold it and put my mind to it. But what of this card? Dine wondered. One of the things he couldn't understand was why this man didn't have anything else on his body. As a merchant, he should at least have some gold in him. Dine quickly took out the purple card and glanced into it. Using the experience with the Chicken King and the Golden Compass, Dine also tried to send his thoughts into the card. His mind shook as he felt a slight jolt that came from the card. 10,231? Dine was confused. Those digits somehow came to mind and it wasn't like a random thought but something very vivid and clear. Is this the golden game? Dine wondered. He thought of something, and suddenly, 
a few coins appeared on his hands. It was precisely the same amount of coins that he wanted to appear. I see. So that's how it works. Dine nodded his head in satisfaction. This must be how our characters bring their money out. But what about items? Where do they keep their inventory? Dine searched the dead man's body and concluded that he had no other items apart from his clothes. Oh well, since he's dead, he must have used up any healing items if he had any. Dine then glanced at the southern mountain and began to move in haste. The windy breeze continued to blow and prevented the mist from approaching. Dine then began to recount into his mind everything about Leg Aya. He knew the game well, but he decided that he had to go over his memory and study it carefully to understand what this world was. While most people only would play the game, Dine had a more profound knowledge of the game's lore. He even understood the backstory of the game. As he immersed himself, he realized that Strafe did something to his memories wherein the details just emerged more vividly than he used to remember. Legaia is a world that was created by a god named Teague. Teague divided himself into two different beings and placed them into two separate dimensions that wouldn't interact. The first realm was the realm of humans, this was the world of Legaia, and the other was the realm of the beings that were called the Saru. The Saru lived in their own dimension, which was Saru Kai, among the Saru. Teague created a stronger and more powerful being to govern the rest of their kinds. These were the Rasaru, yet Teague had long known that the two separate worlds would somehow interact one day, and Teague had created ten Genesis trees in the human world, Legaia, each would contain a slumbering Rasaru. These were so they would awaken in the future and aid mankind in an approaching calamity that would threaten to wipe it out. The calamity began when most of the powerful Rasaru, Rogue, rebelled against Teague, it sought to aid and attempted to get to the human world, for it knew that if it could merge with another human, its power would drastically increase. And so, in his wild ambition, the mightiest angel of Teague, rebelled against his creator. He breached the world of Sarukai to get to the world of Legaia. But before he could complete his goal, Rogue was defeated and banished by Teague into another dimension where it would be unable to reach Sarukai or Legaia. As for Leg Aya, the appearance of the Saru had already happened and could not be stopped. The Saru were rock-like creatures with tremendous powers. Alone, they maintained a solid form. But since Teague was a being who divided himself into Saru and human, the two entities' combined powers would drastically amplify each other. The Saru remains their rock-like form but can change forms when attached to a human being. When the two are combined, it allows the Saru to reveal more power than it can, and the human can harness the power of the Saru to do incredible things. Through the power of the Saru, an average human can lift large boulders on his own. It could even give humans the ability to fly. When merged with a human, the Saru allows them to reveal their special skills. Some Saru's that would be as large as a baby could even transform into a massive creature that is as big as a bus. As for the raw Saru, no other human had ever worn them until the beginning of the game, at least, not to anyone's knowledge. Question mark Dine wondered as a strange sentence was added to his memories. That memory strangely implies that someone already did. But who? Dine shook his head and went back to his memories. The humans befriended the Saris and eventually developed a relational bond with it. The Saru reproduced more. Soon. The humans of Leg AI used Saru's power to fight back and defeat the monster armies that threatened to kill them. Wait, monster army? Dine realized something as he continued to recall the story of Legend of Leg AI. There were no mentions of monster armies in Legend of Leg AI. Is this Strafe's work? Dine continued to think and look into his memory of the game pertaining to monsters. The term a monster army was something new for him. Chapter 8 Understanding Leg AI 2. In the world of Leg AI, humans were weak and were barely surviving. Dine recalled the game's prologue and stated that humans were physically more vulnerable than the wild beasts and monsters that roamed the land. And because they were weaker, they had, on several occasions, came close to extinction. Yet that fact is immediately forgotten as the game begins, and the coming battles would focus on the Cirrus. That's right. Whatever happened to the monsters of this world, what did the mist do to them? Could it be that in this world, Strafe created monsters to complete this destiny? Dine pondered and concentrated on retrieving whatever memory Strafe left for him. And so, the humans built a civilization that used Cirrus to the fullest. Great and grand technologies were developed, 
And soon, even weapons of war that made use of the Cirrus came to the world. As humans grew more powerful, they successfully banished the great monster kings who lived on the Caristo continent. Hey, this is new, Dine smirked. In his original understanding of the game, there was no mention of the monster kings. Dine always believed that the various monsters and enemies that can be fought in the game are Cirrus. But in the memories that Strafe left to him, it now detailed the many monsters' origins within the game. So this world has humans, Suru, and monsters. Dine nodded in understanding. What happened to the monster kings? Dine pondered. The monster kings fled and left the Legaia continent and retreated elsewhere as they fought a losing battle against the humans and Suru. While most of the monster kings had managed to flee and bring their army into a far off land, some monsters that were unable to escape, those that remained were left to fend for themselves and fled a hiding in caves and forests. The humans decided to allow these creatures to reproduce and survive as the body, the bones, and even the flesh of these monsters gave them more resources weapons, and even food. Oh, so that explains the monsters in Lake Aya. It looks like Strafe's version of the game has more side quests. Nice, I'd get to play Lake Aya with an updated version. Thanks, Strafe. Dine dashed on with great glee. He continued to reflect on his memories. If you hear this voice, you must have understood the current ecology of Lake Aya. I did this to make this world harsher. Now, not only will you have to deal with the mist and its henchmen, but you will also deal with the monsters that have now grown in the wild. The mist and the mad Cirrus allowed these monsters to be unhunted, but at the same time, a war between the wild monsters and the Suru kept the few human colonies that you know remained alive in the game. Active, Strafe's voice echoed in Dine's head. Oh, sounds exciting. Instead of being fearful or worried, Dine got all the more excited. Now, let's have a look at my memories of the Suru. Dine continued to reflect as he walked on the side of the beach. The wind from the ocean prevented the dangerous mist from nearing. The Cirrus was generally divided into several elemental affiliations. A Suru would have certain elements that they could wield or command. There were Cirrus of fire, wind, thunder, darkness, light, rock, and water. There are also Cirrus that had no elemental affinity and would gift its wearers with strength and power. There is also another elemental affinity that is known as evil. But of course, you already knew that. Equals D. What? Dine was confused. Why was there an emoticon in his memory? Looks like the strafe has really fallen in love with my world. Dine shook his head and shivered at the possibilities of these odd inceptions that strafe left on his memory. Gritting his teeth and knowing that the cringe was necessary, Dine continued to search his memories. Legaia is divided into three major regions or continents. The first region which became the cradle of civilization in Legaia was the Caristo continent. It had the most advanced utilization of Saru in science. Two mighty kingdoms reigned there, the Sol kingdom and the Konkrim kingdom. Far out on the east to this kingdom, beyond the seas, was another continent. The Sabucus Islands was an archipelago with several hundreds of islands and was known for the productive geothermal environment. This was the second continent in the game. There the Rateyu Kingdom and three prominent towns were present, but since the cities and kingdoms in this continent are further from the cradle of civilization and the location where the Cirrus first appeared, the Sabucus Islands only had a shadow of the technology that Sol and Konkrim had. At the south of this continent, Connected through a large mountain range, it was the youngest continent in the world of Lake Aya. It had very little technology as the way it uses the Cirrus was not as advanced as the former continents. It also had the least discovery of items and magical weapons. They were even unable to use basic tools such as the door of wind that can teleport people from town to town. Oh, right, I didn't notice this when I played. Dine realized it. Drake Kingdom didn't have big buildings or techs apart from the Byron Monastery, which was closest to the entrance of the Sabucus Islands. The Sabucus Islands towns had things like windmills and gun-like weapons, and a sea crossing and transport system. As for the Caristo continent, they had the technology to create tall skyscrapers and could even create powerful bombs. Dine recalled the details of the game. Ugh. So I guess I would have to get to Sabucus Island to enjoy things like air conditioners. Dine cursed, but he then returned to recall the details of the game. 
The game is set 10 years after the appearance of the mysterious mist. The mist would drive the Sirs insane. And when a human being who is wearing the Suru is exposed to the mist, they would end up being possessed. The Suru, who would always be submissive to humans, would possess humans and make them mad. Humans had relied too much on Sirs. And so, when their greatest weapon turned against them, most of the world was destroyed. The kingdoms in the Kiristo continent fell. The towns in Sibucus also suffered. And soon, the mist reached the Drake Kingdom. Hope was lost, and humanity barely survived. Who knew who had escaped the terrors of the mist? Of the few survivors who found a way to avoid the mist's treacherous dangers, the game begins in Drake Continent to one of the towns in the continent's fringe region. Rimelm, Dine whispered as he gazed to the horizon. That town used a large wall to protect itself from and cover the east, west and north sides. They used the sea as a natural barrier. The natural breeze of the coast also helped to keep the mist from drawing close to it. Dine smiled. Since I'm here three years earlier than when the game actually begins, I guess I'd have to learn to love eating fishes. Dine laughed as he continued to run. He then brought to memory the real protagonist of the game. All three resided in the Drake continent. Vaughn was a native of Rimelm. Vaughn should be 11 years old by now. I wonder if he's any strong. To think he would save the world at 14 years old. Dine remembered Vaughn's young age. Three years from now, a catastrophe would befall Rimelm, and Vaughn would awaken the raw Saru of fire. Meta. Vaughn had the most balanced stats in the game where he had decent speed, defense and attack power. The second soon-to-be hero is Noah. In the game, I always make Vaughn and his little childhood friend get together. I wonder if I can. Dine then slapped himself as he considered this and realized that Noah was only 12 years old. Curse you, game designer. With your designs of Noah, she looked at least 18. How dare you make me think such crazy thoughts. Dine cursed. Oh, right. The entire game must have spawned years. Ugh. Stop thinking, Dine. She'd still be a minor. Dine slapped himself once more. All right, so Noah has her background. And Vaughn would later rescue her and, in the process, awaken the second Rosaru. Dine focused. Noah would be the wielder of the Rosaru of Wind. Terra, like the wind, she would have the highest speed but have weaker damage. Noah has the least upper body defense but the strongest lower body strength thanks to her training from Terra who emphasized speed. She, however, also had the least mod of the three. The last main character of the game is Gaela. A Byron monk resides inside a well-guarded monastery to the east of Drake Kingdom. He would soon forsake the monk vow of never wearing a Saru when he is forced to be the third raw Saru wielding hero. He would be partnered with the raw Saru of Lighting, Ozma. Gaela had powerful strength and defense. The hugest mana pool of the three but he is also the slowest, Meta, Terra, and Ozma. Dine smiled as he thought of this, if things go as planned, I'll have a Rosaru of my own. As Dine continued to run and recall the game basics, he saw a familiar man-like creature at a distance. The power of the golden compass warned him of that enemy. What the? But I'm not on the mist. Dine frowned. Oh, right. That must be a monster. Dine slowed down and grasped the golden compass. Its effect appeared as a strange power enveloped him. A gobu gobu. Dine was surprised as he recognized the enemy monster. Chapter 9. Gobu gobu. My first monster. Wow. Dine noticed the monster even when it was quite far from it. The gobu gobu was one of the first monsters that could be fought outside of Rim Elm. They were humanoid monsters that wore loincloths and had a shield on the one hand and a blue blade attached to the other arm's forearm. They looked like yellow-skinned goblins but had a much taller frame that could go as tall as an adult human. Looks like it can't see me yet. Is this the power of the golden compass? Dine realized that his senses were more sensitive in detecting enemies. Dine paused and dropped himself on the sand and tried to camouflage himself. That monster should be weak, right? I mean. It can easily be defeated by a level 1, Vaughn. Dine thought to himself, if a 14-year-old kid could kill it, I should be able to. Dine thought as he glanced at his fist. It was then that he noticed it. Why are my arms smaller? Dine wondered. Dine immediately rolled silently towards where the water was. The crashing waves were strong, but the water was clean. He looked at himself and was shocked. I'm younger. Dine finally realized it. 
It was then that the words of Strafe echoed in his mind, to send you into this game, I had to destroy your body and recreate it in this game, and to help you with your future cultivation, I made you younger than you were, you are currently 10 years old, just a year younger than Vaughn, but don't worry, I retained most of the strength you have, apart from adjusting yourself from the size difference, you should be able to fight just as you did in your previous life, you freaking killed me, Dine cursed, oh well. I guess it's better this way, why is age needed for cultivation, Dine pondered, Welp, time to test it out, Dine readied and slowly moved from his position towards the Gabu Gabu that was wandering alone, he quickly made a sprint, the golden compass allowed them to sense the enemies ahead from where they were and provide a strange mirage like effect that cloaked his appearance, however, the closer the wearer was to the enemy, the weaker the outcome is, when Dine held the golden compass with the intent to use it. He soon realized that his appearance would remain cloaked at around 20 meters from the enemy. Once he moves any closer, his figure would be visible and would alert the enemy. This was how the game item, Golden Compass, would allow its wearers to increase the likeliness of performing a surprise attack, which granted the players the capability of performing the first attack in combat. Dine rushed faster and faster and moved around the Gabu Gabu. He made sure to stick right behind the Gabu Gabu before running forward to attack. My strength should equate to a level 3. Vaughn, Dine whispered confidently to himself before he made a substantial leap towards the Gabu Gabu. Dine flew overhead the Gabu Gabu. As Strafe promised, Dine still wielded the same strength he had from before. He used one of the attacks he devised in the real world. It was a surprise attack made to assassinate his enemies by breaking their necks. Dine grabbed the head of the Gabu Gabu as he flew above and used his entire body weight and strength to spin around. And like a bottle cap being spun off, the neck of the Gabu Gabu twisted. A cracking sound was heard, but suddenly, the Gabu Gabu cried and struggled. Dine fell on the sand and cursed. Damn, he's got about twice the muscles compared to a full-grown man. Dine cursed, the Gabu Gabu looked as if it was in pain, gazed angrily at Dine, and charged off, it swung its right arm, and Dine parried by ducking and immediately swept the feet of the Gabu Gabu, the sweeping kick wasn't strong enough to move through the second leg, but it still caused the Gabu Gabu to lose balance, Dine immediately took advantage of the Gabu Gabu's stagger, and he sprung up and grabbed the sword arm of the Gabu Gabu and quickly stabbed it towards the other arm that held a small shield. The Gabu Gabu shrieked in pain as it stumbled. Dine's body continued to move swiftly as he kicked the fallen wee Gabu Gabu on the face. The Gabu Gabu quickly rolled away in pain and promptly retrieved the sword that stabbed on its other arm and tried to stand up. But Dine was ready. He had already circled behind the Gabu Gabu and jumped once more. Since the Gabu Gabu was still trying to stand up, Dine jumped from its back again. And this time, he used his legs to create a pincer lock around the head of the Gabu Gabu before twisting again using his full strength. Crack. Another cracking sound was heard, only this time, Dine was confident that he broke the neck of the Gabu Gabu. The monster fell, and Dine crashed on the sand as well. The battle happened quickly. If it weren't for Dine's tremendous experience in killing people, his failure to immediately execute the Gabu Gabu on the first attack would have been dangerous for most people. Dine was gasping for breath as he laid on the sand, he was secretly cursing, the Gabu Gabu was far stronger than he imagined, he slowly released his lock and noticed strange golden energy coming out of the enemy, and various power was being drawn towards Dine, for some strange reason, the energy looked like the same golden coins he saw earlier, if you hear this message, it means you have made your first kill, Strafe's words resounded once more, concentrate on the monster before you, I have imparted the knowledge of how to gather its energy, Dine pondered and concentrated upon hearing Strafe's command, suddenly, the energy of the Gabu Gabu was rushing towards him, the path of martial cultivation is harsh and difficult, it requires physical training, strengthening the mind and the spirit, the easiest is physical, in my world, the energy of the world may be absorbed to strengthen the body, it may be done anywhere. Although there are specific regions that may increase the ability to gather the world's energy to feed the body. 
The energy that Dun received from the Gabu Gabu somehow made him feel strengthened. Another way to grow stronger in my world is to battle monsters and take their course to absorb the energy. In this world, I followed the experience-based system. All monsters of this world are born with the innate ability to gather a portion of energy from the enemies that they manage to kill. Humans, however, will need to rely on other means. The energy gathering stopped, but Dine noticed that there remained the same golden liquid which almost had the same shade as the coins he managed to take out earlier. However, there are two types of energy that exists, the energies that the body has already converted to empower the body, mind, and soul can be absorbed, and the other is their life energy. For humans, it would be their blood. For monsters and Suru, it would be that golden liquid before you. That is also the currency in this world. Dine was stunned. That's money? Oh right. In Legaia. You do get gold from enemies. If you have found the merchant who held on to the three items you requested, then you should have found the card. I don't know how much money he would have, but I have determined that his fate would cause him to spend most of his gold on something else right before he travels and dies to where he is now. I don't want you to be super rich now. Dine couldn't help but curse. For crying out loud, what's a little bit more money? What a cheapskate. Dine grumbled. Use the card to draw in life energy. It's designed to have the same form and function as with my world. Dine held the card and moved closer towards the golden liquid. The gold was immediately absorbed. As you can see, it may take a while for the card to absorb life energy. You should make sure to hide any monsters you kill unless other monsters would take notice. The voice narrated. What? Dine was confused. The life energy had been drained almost immediately. Dine remained for a minute holding the card next to the body. But no more golden blood appeared. Was this monster anemic or something? Where is the rest of the blood? Dine frowned. Dine checked on the card and found that the number on the card has increased by 15. It was now 10,246. That should be about right. Gabu Gabu should give about 15 gold each. Did I already acquire all the gold? Oh, well. Dine shook his head and was about to run when it glanced at the protruding blade and the shield that the Gabu Gabu held onto. Dine removed the shield, but as he was about to take away the blade, he noticed that the blade was connected to his arm as if it was a bone protruding out. Ugh, it looks like I'll make do with this shield then. Dine frowned and started to run on the side of the sea. Would you like to hear about my world's cultivation and how this world can affect your strength and the real world? A voice prompt was heard. Dine almost stumbled as he heard that. He had long deduced that Strafe reserved many messages for him now that Strafe has fallen into slumber. If yes, please say, a continue. For a dying guy, you sure know how to have some fun. Continue. Dine replied mentally. Chapter 10, A Strange Scene. You have selected to hear about my world. To stop. Say pause. To begin. Say start. Start. Dine was in tears as he ran. Dine, the real world and the worlds that I will create will have similar cultivation principles. In my world, the cultivation levels of a mortal are divided into five levels. Six if you count mortal severing. The cultivation level that you are at now is the weakest, and that is the martial advent stage. Believe it or not, your current level is only at level one. Dine nearly stumbled again. I'm that weak? Dine cursed. The martial advent stage is divided into ten levels. Each level is equal to a level in the game. This means you are currently a level 1 martial advent practitioner. Normally, you'd have to go through various means to strengthen your body and contain more energy to rise in the ranks of the martial advent in other stages. There are many ways to do this, but I've provided you with means in this world, and those are the Genesis trees. Genesis trees, Dine repeated as he thought back. The voice prompt of Strafe mysteriously paused as Dine recalled his memories. Legaia had ten Genesis trees, and awakening a tree would strengthen the Rosaru, so here it will be necessary for me to get physically stronger as well? Dine pondered, let me continue with the other stages first to explain this after the martial advent stage is the martial novice stage. It is again divided into ten stages, but this stage is harsher than the first. In this stage, you need to level up twice in this world to rise one level in the martial novice stage, two levels per rank, 
Huh, Dine committed this to memory, after Marshall Novice's martial formation, this is the stage that I hope you reach before you go to the world Brigandine. I choose Brigandine over Final Fantasy Tactics because you can gain the powers to control an army in Brigandine, something which may prove necessary in the future, but in that game. You can also use the class systems to create the foundation of your martial code. Several scenes flashed before Dine's eyes. In the quick vision, Dine saw various types of warriors in Strafe's world. Some people controlled fire, people who wielded weapons that could break the earth, people who could transform their body parts and turn into giant beings of great might. The martial code stage is a stage that most martial artists repeat at least two times. It is the stage where they reform their bodies to contain the specific power they set out to master. In the visions you saw, those people had repeated that stage at least three times. This stage cannot be easily divided into levels as it simply is a stage where you are building your code. Of course, reaching higher levels is always important as it would make you stronger. In the world of Brigandine, you could master your code by leveling up there. If you plan to pursue three martial codes and master one, you would be considered someone having reached the next stage, the martial expert stage. Dine couldn't help but give a low whistle. In the visions he saw, those men had tremendous powers that could break mountains. If you continue to hone your abilities and reach the very edges of what is humanly possible, you then reach the martial peak stage. In most of the kingdoms and realms in my worlds, this is the ultimate peak, of course, for you. Therein lies the next game. The game that will allow you to perform your mortal severing and ascend to sainthood. Those visions that I gave you were from martial experts. And they are like chickens to those in the martial peak stage. And to saints. These experts are like grass or ants. Dine gulped. But don't worry. I have laid out the path for you through the games. You will grow stronger. Leveling up in the game world will make you stronger in the real world as well. Not to mention. I have designed the three games to strengthen the different aspects you need to improve on specifically, but more on that later. For now, play to your heart's content. Just know that the real world is harsher than the current Legend of Leg AI that you are playing right now. The voice stopped. Dine sighed as he continued to run on the coastlines. There were times that some monsters could be seen. He saw green slimes, which he knew to be another native in Leg AI. But as he sensed that there was something corrosive in the slime, he decided not to attack it. He circled the slime, continued to flee, and slowly approached the small mountain that covered his destination site. The side of the mountain had rocky edges, the waves hammered strongly against it. Dine was confident in his swimming skills and chose this route to get to Rim Elm. Dine decided to walk on the coastlines instead of traveling a straight line towards the mountain. At one point, he could see the edges of a large walled town. Is that Trim Elm? Dine squinted his eyes. I guess with its population after converting it from game to reality it would be a bit bigger than the one in the game. Dine shrugged it off and continued to walk by the seashore. He soon encountered another Gabu Gabu, but this Gabu Gabu seemed to have been running away from someone. Dine paused and noticed that it was being chased by three Gabu Gobus and a green slime. What? Dine frowned at the scene. He immediately dropped the sand and used his commando tactics to camouflage himself as he observed the Gabu Gobus. Looks like the monster world is not as united as I thought it would be. The other Gabu Gabus had green slimes accompanying them. This was something that Dine recalled to really happen in the game. Why are they chasing that Gabu Gabu? Dine frowned and tried to think, but nothing from Strafe was brought to mind. Out of his curiosity, Dine activated the golden compass and began to move closer towards the group. The Gabu Gabu was running fast. The slime was surprisingly fast for its large and slimy form. Although it was slower than the Gabu Gabu, it could easily catch up to it. The Gabu Gabu continued to run and run and was headed for the rocky part of the mountain. As Dine drew closer and closer, he made sure to leave a distance that would disable the golden compass's cloaking effect. Soon he caught sight of something familiar on the hands of the chased Gabu Gabu. It looked like a black chain-like object with metal a beak protruding out of its cap-like head. It also had two sharp blades as feet. A gimmerd. Dine realized what it was. It was a Saru. Why are they fighting over a gimmerd? Dine couldn't understand it. Dine followed the group as they continued to run towards the mountain. It ran towards a narrow path on the edge of the mountain that was overlooking the sea. 
the waves below it crashed strongly against the sedimentary rocks. It wasn't a conducive escape path, especially when the Gabu Gabu was carrying an apparently dead gimmerd on its hands. Soon the Gabu Gabu carrying the gimmerd reached a dead end. A small cove was formed with a small path. The Gabu Gabu faced his pursuers. To his right was a massive rocky wall, and to his left was a cliff. The three Gabu Gabus appeared to be laughing and waited for the green slime to move closer. Dine stood afar and hid by the rocks just in case and observed. The monsters seemed to be communicating with each other. The first Gabu Gabu seemed to be in fear as it stood with its back against the wall. It held the shield and aimed the blue sword protruding out of its left hand and was shouting some in some strange language. The three Gabu Gabu and the green slime started to encircle the lone Gabu Gabu. Ah. Uh, Screw it. I'll just save the Gabu Gabu and see what happens. Dine finally acted. He was among the elite soldiers of Earth and even worked together with several task forces all over the world. His skill and stealth was among the top of the world. And now, he had the golden compass to aid him further. His sprint was fast and precise. At that moment, the three creatures began attacking the lone Gabu Gabu. And this was as Dine predicted. He had already faced one wee Gabu Gabu and could roughly make out the strength of these creatures. Recalling how his leg sweep was only able to break the foothold of one foot, he adjusted the force he exerted and went all out. The Gabu Gabu nearest the cliff was the first to receive the attack. Using the shield he retrieved from the first Gabu Gabu, Dine's shield tackled the rushing Gabu Gabu. Smash! The Gabu Gabu was immediately thrown towards the sea. The waves crashed and bashed. It would take a while for that Gabu Gabu to resurface if the Gabu Gabu knew how to swim. Chapter 11 An Unlikely Alliance The remaining Gabu Gabu didn't notice it as the wounded Gabu Gabu also attacked recklessly. Dine immediately used the rebounding force of hitting the first Gabu Gabu to bounce towards the other two in the green slime. Dine jumped up kicked another Gabu Gabu on the face. The Gabu Gabu was stunned by the attack that he stumbled towards the green slime. The Gabu Gabu howled as the green slime was preparing to attack. The acidic properties of slime had already been activated when the Gabu Gabu was kicked headfirst into the goo. A shrill cry erupted as the Gabu Gabu's body dove into the slime. The green slime was panicking and tried to move away from the Gabu Gabu. The cry alerted the two Gabu Gobas who began fighting. Dine threw the shield towards the last Gabu Gabu and struck it on the neck. The Gabu Gabu choked and staggered. What are you doing? Kill that guy. Dine yelled immediately as he ordered the dumbfounded Gabu Gabu. The command awoke the Gabu Gabu. Whether or not it understood Dine's words, he still acted and immediately stabbed the enemy Gabu Gabu. Dine continued to attack and deliver kicks and punches to keep the Gabu Gabu inside the green slime. Its corrosive acid wasn't working anymore, but the Gabu Gabu couldn't breathe. The slime tried to move forward and backward, but it couldn't get its body out of the Gabu Gabu. The Gabu Gabu, who was saved, kept glancing at Dine curiously, but he didn't attack. The slime began to escape, but the Gabu Gabu with a dead gimmerd stood on the narrow path out of the cove to block the slime and keep it from retreating. Finally, the Gabu Gabu, who had its head stuck inside the slime, breathed its last after several minutes of struggling. Dine was just too malicious as he kept kicking the Gabu Gabu to lose its balance. The slime glanced towards the two enemies and was starting to show signs of fear as it trembled and retreated. The Gabu Gabu's eyes lit up, and he approached the slime and stabbed his arms towards the slime. For some strange reason, the Gabu Gabu wasn't burned as he reached towards the core of the slime. The green slime didn't resist and waited. A golden glow occurred at the core. After removing his hands, the Gabu Gabu moved towards Dine and began to talk in a strange language. Even though the path was opened, the green slime didn't run. Dine was startled. Is this how Gabu Gabus group together with slimes? They tame it? Dine wondered. I guess I'd have to ask Strafe about this when he wakes up. Dine walked towards the two dead Gabu Gabu and motioned for the Gabu Gabu to approach as he pointed towards the dead bodies. Let's share the experience between these two, but I'm getting the gold. Alright, Dine waved his hands, and the golden liquid was immediately absorbed towards the purple card. But what surprised Dine was that the gold he got from the Gabu Gabu was actually 50. What? They had a 25 each? Are they some higher level Gabu Gabu? Dine wondered. 
But then he tossed the idea back and pointed to the Gabu Gabu and towards the remaining energy. Suddenly, some growling noise could be heard on the side, and Dine and the Gabu Gabu stood up. It was the first Gabu Gabu who was tossed towards the sea. He managed to climb up. The Gabu Gabu next to Dine immediately moved and stabbed the head of the Gabu Gabu as it was climbing up. After killing it, the Gabu Gabu carried it and placed it next to Dine. Eh? Are you giving the gold to me? No need. I have quite a bit. What I need is experience. But since you helped, let's share the experience from the three. Dine smiled. But for some strange reason, the Gabu Gabu didn't move. Eh? You won't get the energy? Fine. Then I'll go ahead and eat the energy of these two. Alright? Dine smiled as he sat down and channeled the technique to gather the energy. The energy was absorbed, but because Dine felt a bit guilty, he pointed to the last Gabu Gabu, who had the gold. Since you killed it, you should at least get the gold. Dine explained. The Gabu Gabu glanced back at Dine and slowly moved towards the Gabu Gabu who still continued to bleed the golden liquid. The Gabu Gabu opened his mouth as a strange force suddenly began to absorb the liquid. The liquid energy slowly gathered. I see, for us, it's gold, but for these monsters, it is their experience. Dine concluded. Does that mean that the gold I have can make them go stronger? The Gabu Gabu stopped gathering the energy, and despite his monstrous look, he seemed to have a grateful expression towards. Dine then took his purple card and retrieved 100 coins. He placed 50 right next to the Gabu Gabu and 50 next to the slime. Big Ak Gagak Mogak Sagak Agak Kingak. For some strange reason, Dine could understand his words. Isn't that Filipino language with the Gak word at the end of each syllable? On his tours in the Philippines, Dine befriended a group of young kids he rescued from a sex slave ring. He bonded with the kids in the short time that he was based on the Philippines. Because of the necessity of his various missions, Dine was an amateur speaker in multiple languages such as Japanese, Korean, Mandarin, and Kosa. He was, however, fluent in Russian and Filipino. Dine decided to test his theory. Ogak Ogak, Dine answered. Yes, the Gabu Gabu was startled. Say Gak Ligak Tagak Gabu, language Gabu, what? You speak that Gak language those kids taught? Dine was startled. The little kids he spent time with would secretly accompany him to play games and taught him a coded language that uses the Filipino language and adds the word Gak, Shak, Ba, and other syllables. This was how they spoke and helped Dine acquire a low-tech cell phone to emulate PS1 games. Of course, it was short-lived since his superiors found out and sent Dine to Kenya and took his cell phone from him like a parent disciplining their child. Wow, how nostalgic. I wonder how those kids are? Dine laughed. The first sentence that the Gabu Gabu asked was if Dine was giving him the gold. Dine responded and said yes, to which startled the Gabu Gabu. The Gabu Gabu exclaimed that Dine could speak the language of Gabu. Pagak nogak ngak tingak digak? How understand? Oh. You seemed to be using some form of broken Filipino language with the Gak. Is this strafe having fun? Dine suspected that this mortal ascending strafe seemed to have been so in love with the earthly culture that he went all out and used even the smallest details in Dine's memory. Wait, does that mean, strafe can do memes? Dine had a revelation, Pagak Rigok, friend? The Gabu Gabu called out, Agak Nogak Pangak Gagak Langak Mogak, what's your name? Dine's mouth was getting thirsty. It had been a while since he spoke in Gak codes. Pangak Gagak Lengak, name? The Gabu Gabu repeated. Dine nodded his head. Bertuga Lionel. The Gabu Gabu replied. What the firmament? Dine cursed out loudly. How did your name become Bertugo? And what's with the Lionel? Sounds like some classy English name. Dine gave a frustrated cry. The Gabu Gabu tilted his head and glanced at Dine with a bewildered expression. Bertugo. Agak Kogak Sigak Dine, Buryutugo. I am Dine, Dine introduced himself, Sigak Dine, am Dine, the Gabu Gabu repeated, no, just Dine, Agak Kogak Dine, I, Dine, Dine repeated but removed the identifier a Sigak, Dine, the Gabu Gabu also repeated, so it really is a broken up Filipino dialect, I guess I'll have to try to speak like that, 
so proper nouns don't need the gak. Dine analyzed the language based on his discussion with the Gabu Gabu. Dine then began to use this language and explained that he could give those coins to him and the slime pet as long as the Gabu Gabu gave him the gimrit and made Bertuga promise not to hurt any humans. Surprisingly, the Gabu Gabu immediately agreed. Dine paused for a bit and decided to try. Pwegak digak baratgo tribo. Er is it tribo or trigak bogak? Anyway. Igak bagak gabu gabu pagak milgak yagak wagak hagak wagak tagak ogak erm. Like me, Dine then pointed to himself. Dine was trying to urge the gabu gabu to make his tribe or family stop attacking humans. Rim elm, wagalagak wagak rim elm, don't fight rim elm. Dine then pointed towards the direction of Rim Elm to clarify what it he meant. Surprisingly, the Gabu Gabu nodded again. What? You will? Agak Kogak Igak Sagak, Pagak Tagak Pagak Milgak Yagak, I alone. Family dead, Bertugo replied with a very complicated expression. Dine's expression softened. Bertugo was alone. His tribe or family had all died. After much contemplating, Dine finally broke his silence. I think having a gabu gabu around would be helpful. Say Bertugo, say gak magak kagak rimelm, follow me rimelm? Dine asked with a smile on his face. The expression of Bertugo was confused and wondered why the human wanted to make him go to rimelm together. Take your little slime too. I think you can really help us. Dine laughed. Chapter 12 Reaching Rimelm Dine convinced Bertugo to go with them. It took a long time since Dine had a hard time talking and understanding with Bertugo. Finally, after ironing out the details, Bertugo agreed. Since Dine can understand Gabu talk, he was perhaps the only human being who could talk and mediate between man and Gabu. The Gabu Gabu would live under the protection of Rim Elm and could even use his knowledge about the other Gabu Gabu tribes to help the village. Dine also took this advantage because he knew how strong the Gabu Gabu was compared to normal humans. They had muscles about twice the strength of normal humans and therefore had a biological advantage in strength. Only humans with surus could easily defeat them, but with the mist, no human would dare to wear a suru. Dine waited for the Gabu Gabu to absorb the coins. He increased the coins to 250. The Gabu Gabu would consume 200 while the other 50 would go to the green slime. And so, the two increased their strength as they absorbed it. Dine guarded the narrow path. Great, my first day in a cultivation world and here I am guarding two monsters as they reach their breakthroughs. Dine gave a sad sigh. Oh well, I wonder if the slime could be eaten by humans? Maybe that's how Gabu Gabus survive in this harsh world. They farm slimes as they can take them and do. They eat the goo? Dine continued to think. Soon Bertugo approached Dine and began to extend his hand towards Dine and rubbed his chest. It appeared to be a heartfelt gesture. Dine simply smiled and walked back towards the cove. He then saw the slime and immediately asked Bertugo if slimes could float. Bertugo nodded, but a bit of confusion appeared on his eyes. Soon, the plan was made, and the action was taken. Dine knew that there was no way to use the coastlines to reach Rim Elm. The waves were just too strong, but seeing how terrifying this world was, the initial plans that Dine had made had to change. He decided to head to Rim Elm first before initiating his actual plans. As such, they used the giant slime as a flotation device and swam through the ocean. They had a slime boat, and it made it easier for them to go through the strong waves. It was a hard and tiresome journey. But the stamina and strength of the leveled up Gabu Gabu and Slime showed their resilience. Soon, they made it past the strong waves and returned to the coastlines. Dine had asked Bertugo if it was okay for them to kill other Gabu Gabu. Bertugo immediately nodded and explained that the Gabu Gabu was a carnivorous tribe that ate each other. So, it literally is a dog eat dog world for you guys. Dine couldn't help but sigh. It was then that Dine reached out towards his items and poured on his thoughts in it. In the game Legend of Legaia, only one member of their party could be equipped with the items like Golden Compass and Chicken King for it to have its effect. Dine wanted to know how to use it with a three-person team. Dine got his answer. I see, so three of the closest people near me within three meters will give the cloaking and sensing powers of the Golden Compass to allow surprise attacks to the enemy. And I just need to send a marking energy for the Chicken King. Dine immediately used both and Bertugo. 
and the slime had a faint orange-like glow that quickly disappeared. The energy surprised Bertugo. It was the first time he sensed such powers around him. He gave Dine another grateful glance. The party reached the shores, and Rimelm could be seen from afar. It was past noon when they crossed the mountain, and Dine immediately set forth to run towards Rimelm. They could see the town from a distance, but Dine underestimated how large the entire Drake Kingdom was. By Dine's estimates, it would be nearly evening for them to reach Rimelm. Luckily, the Gabu Gabu in this region were usually alone since there was not much food in this area. Dine asked why this was so, and Bertugo explained that most of the animals that they hunt appear closer to the mountain and the forest nearby. Only a few wild animals ever reach this side of the area, and so only weaker Gabu Gobas who were either looking for green slime to tame would occasionally wander here to hunt for animals. The group met another Gabu Gabu which they immediately killed thanks to their first attack advantage. The green slime suddenly covered the entire Gobby Gobu and began to carry it. Wow, it can carry stuff. Dine admired. Why didn't the humans tame green slimes? Dine pondered. But he knew this was something that Bertugo couldn't answer. The group found two more Gobby Gobus and killed them along the way. The green slime ate one of the Gobu Gobu. Dine wanted to make the slime carry the body but since it wouldn't fit, Dine asked Bertugo if he could command the green slime to divide into two as it could in game. Bertugo soon understood it and ordered the slime to divide, and so, each slime carried one wee Gabu Gabu along with the shield and the blue blade that was not dissolved when the slime ate one of the Gabu Gabu. The four person team continued to move, although one of the slimes no longer had a golden compass's camouflaging effects. Dine wasn't worried as they were getting closer towards the town the slime could be used as bait to lure more enemies. Sadly, no enemies appeared, not even a single slime. It was late in the afternoon when the town of Rimelm could be seen. Dine undid the effects of the golden compass and walked carefully. Bertugo wondered why Dine's speed had slowed down, but then, his questions were soon answered. A group of hunters was approaching. They had over 20 men who were hastily running back. Dine called out to them and waved his arms to alert the group. The hunters noticed Dine from afar and saw the creatures next to him. They raised their bows and spears as they approached. But then Dine immediately called out with the list of lies he had long prepared. Hunters of Rimelm, do not be afraid. I am Dine Valiant, a man from the Great Sol Kingdom and Caristo. I had traveled and was near Rateyu Kingdom before the mist came and have arrived here. Please do not be afraid of these monsters next to me. They have tamed creatures that Sol has captured and are my pets. They have also been my helpers during my travels. Dine explained. A man walked forward and gave him a surprised look. You are from Sol Kingdom? The man asked in a shocked expression. The hunters behind him were all startled. You know of Sol? Then you must have at least heard of the Great Muscle Dome. They tame monsters and make them fight, but they are trained not to kill. My father is one of Sala's trainers, and these pets of mine have traveled with me here. Juno was startled. He had long heard of how monsters were forced to fight each other in a battle coliseum in Sala's kingdom. Rumors of monster taming had been around for so long. You are a monster tamer? The man asked again. I am not. But I have lived long enough with Bertugo here that I can speak his language. Please do not hurt him, he is the reason why I have survived for so long. The two slimes you see are the monsters he has tamed. You must have noticed that slimes can be tamed by Gabu Gobus, right? Dine asked. The hunters nodded, and the man in front also held a look of disbelief. If you still don't believe me, Bertugo. Pungak Tagak Kagak Hatgak Ugak Kogak Kangak Yagak, Dine then ordered. Bertugo glanced at Dine with hesitation, but Dine smiled back. Bertugo nodded and moved towards the hunter. The hunter warily held his weapon as the Gabu Gabu moved closer. I have ordered him to bow to you to show you that I am his master, Dine explained. As Bertugo bowed, the entire hunters all exclaimed loudly. He bowed. By Teague, he did. Another hunter exclaimed. It seems we have a lot to talk about. I welcome you, visitor. I am Juno, a hunter of Rimelm. Let us move inside. Juno smiled and approached Dine and bowed. A trace of tears could be seen in his eyes. Dine was surprised. He knew who Juno is. This was the father of Mai 
who is Vaughn's love interest, Juno would die at the very start of the game because of the mist. To think that Juno was actually an important character among the hunters, it's been so long that I have seen another human, young child, please, follow me, child, Dine almost got mad but recalled he was just 10 years old, he shook his head and followed, the two slimes and the gobu gobu also followed Dine, the hunters behind Juno still maintained a shocked expression, it's us, we are back, the hunter shouted loudly, and we have a guest, a survivor from the mist is here, hurry and open up, Juno demanded almost impatiently, the doors of Rim Elm opened, Dine smiled excitedly, finally, chapter 13, entering the village, the doors opened, and the entire team hastily made it inside, Dine could not help but look back and see the mist slowly approaching, as he entered, he was greeted with a familiar scene he knew long well, the village of Rim Elm had survived the mist's catastrophe by relying on the vast plains before them, which allowed them to hunt for food to survive. A large wall was erected to cover the entire village, the walls then extended out to the sea and even reached the deeper areas of the sea, as such, the mist could not enter even through the seaside as the windy beach acted as a natural protection that repelled the mist, while Dine had been walking back to Rim Elm. He already understood several factors that allowed Rim Elm to survive, they were far from the mist generators, and the wind that blew also helped them drive off the mists, as Dine looked around. He realized that the town was several times bigger than it was in the game. There were more houses and more hunters in the city. A large hill with a house on top could be seen to the east of the village. A sloping landscape led downwards to a beautifully decorated garden at the center of the town. A small green tree without leaves could be seen. Dine could not help but admire the bright green tree in the middle. This was the tree that would save Legaia. Genesis tree, Dine muttered. Yes, our town is blessed to have this amazing tree. Perhaps it, because we have this tree, is how Tig allowed us to survive for too long. Juno laughed. The word broke out that a young boy had made it to Rim Elm, and what was even more terrifying was the fact that he had a gobu gobu with him. Everyone went out to see who it was. There, Dine could make out the familiar figures. He saw an older man who went out of the house on top of the hill. Is that your village elder? Dine asked Juno. Yes, that is our village elder. Elder Mora. Mora? His name is Village? Dine knew that in the English game, the village elder was called the village elder. But who would have thought that his name was Mora, which is village in Japanese? What? No nothing. Dine quickly shook his head. Another familiar figure came. It was a beautiful young girl. So, that's my. Dine thought but dared not give her any more look as her father is Juno, the current hunter. Another figure approached. It was a man who was limping and carried a stick with him. That is the former head of the hunt, Val. He is a brave man, Juno explained. Vaughn's father, Dine thought once more. It was then that a figure clothed in a red garment jumped from the high fences of the town to get to the entrance quickly. It was a middle-aged monk. He landed towards the ground and looked at the young boy, and smiled, Tetsu. It was Dine's first time seeing him, but he knew that the power that this Tetsu had eclipsed everyone else in this village combined. If you are hearing this, then you must have met Tetsu. As you can see, he is a powerful man, as a reference. Tetsu is someone at the middle martial novice stage, Strafe's voice echoed, impressive, a young warrior, Tetsu gave his analysis as he looked at Dine, he's a fighter, Juno was surprised, he's probably stronger than you, what is your name, mighty warrior, I am Dine Valiant, and compared to you, I should be nothing, Dine laughed with an embarrassed expression, Dine gave a relieved sigh, when he saw how strong this world was, Dine decided not to pursue his plans immediately but head to Rim Elm. The reason was that he knew that Tetsu was here, and he would be Dine's quickest way to achieve the plans he has. While many characters surrounded Dine, Dine's attention fell on one of the young boys who had braved through the crowds to see Dine. He was a young boy with blue hair. He silently stood afar and gazed at the gobu gobu and slime with a complicated expression, and his eyes locked on with Dine's eyes. The main character, Vaughn. Dine couldn't help but laugh as he finally saw the young child, who he controlled several times playing this game. Juno, who is this friend? The elder's voice echoed at the back as he finally reached the area. Elder, this young man is not wearing any saru. He claimed to be from Saul Kingdom and had the gobu gobu and slime with him since childhood. Saul Kingdom, 
The elder was astounded at the declaration. Daddy, where is Saul? Mai's gentle voice asked. Erm, right. Before we continue talking, I'd like it if my monsters and I can rest. Bertugo. Egak bagak lagak bazgak kangak gabu gabu gimerd. Dain ordered his monsters to spit out the remains of the gabu gabu and the gimerd. Bertugo nodded and gave a low growl to which the two green slimes regurgitated the pair of dead gabu gabu and the unconscious gimerd. Several startled cry was heard, but since Tetsu did not panic, most hunters remained calm. Two dead gabu gabu. You you killed them? Of course we did. I only have this guy with me. On our way here. We had to kill a few. This is, after all, Bertugo's meal. Dine shrugged. Me meal? Several of the ladies in the village cried out in surprise. Yes, Gabu Gabu is a carnivorous race that eats each other. Unless they are with the same tribe or family, they will eat each other. Val explained. There are about three tribes outside. That Gabu Gabu doesn't seem to belong to a tribe I recognize. Val added. Now that you mention it. Juno nodded in realization. I'm sorta hungry too. Dine laughed out loud to change the topic. He was sweating because he didn't know that Gabu Gabu's half tribes. It would have been troublesome if Gabu Gabu belonged to a familiar tribe. Erm. Can I trade these Gabu Gabu weapons for something? Dine asked. You are one of us now. Dine. For food. You do not need to pay. Juno laughed. I would like to also speak to you. The elder requested. I understand. Elder, treat me as one of your own. I only request that you treat Bertugo the same way as well as his slimes. He tamed the slime on the way here. Dine explained. I understand. But please allow us to base your Gabu Gabu at the beach area, away from all the townsfolk as the children and the old men would be scared. The elder asked. It's fine. Dine nodded. That night, a grand feast occurred although they were festive. It was very much a quiet celebration where all the families of the town had gathered. Dine's appearance brought them hope. There were more survivors of the mist. They held their celebration at the beach. Rim Elm was made right near the beach's shores and had walls that extended out into the deeper parts of the sea. This allowed them to send fishermen to catch fish and, at the same time, used the deep sea to stop cirrus or monsters from entering or circling the wall. The sea was basically one of the safest place in the village as the breeze steadily blew and kept the mist out. They celebrated and ate, and various hunters continued to ask Dine about the outside world. Dine gave some simple answers and made sure that he wouldn't go into much detail. I have to talk with the elder first and tell him everything about what I know. I know you guys find it scary, and it is, but trust me, when I say this, we have hope. I had been looking for a village for a long time. And it was Bertugo who would go out in the open and travel all over the place to find me a good hiding place. But now that I'm here, I guess we have hope. Dine smiled. Various hunters and even the children couldn't understand what Dine meant. What do you mean, young warrior? Tetsu asked. Think about it. I have a Gabu Gabu with me, and I can speak Gabu Gabu. If we find ways to make alliances in this harsh world and make trades, we can probably find a way to make a society in this darkness. Some of the Gabu Gabu are after Cirrus. Bertugo told me this as he wandered in the mist and saw this. They want the energy within the Cirrus as it makes them stronger and even allows them to have more power. Dine explained. What? They fight the Cirrus? Yes, but an average Gabu Gabu can't defeat the Cirrus. We fought those two Gabu Gabu when they found us. They were after the Gimmer that we had, for personal reasons. I refused to give them the Gimmerd and I killed the Gabu Gobus. Wait, you're saying that you killed a Gabu Gabu, or is it that you're Slime and the Gabu Gabu who killed them? Stop exaggerating. A young boy sneered. Dine knew who this little boy was. It was the young Ixis who was one of the minor named characters in the game. He always was arrogant and had some sort of rivalry against Vaughn. Yup. Dine laughed. Don't forget where I came from. I am from Saul. I trained at the Muscle Dome and fought Gabu Gabu regularly. Of course, since it was sparing, we didn't kill them. What have you done, kid? Dine boasted. It was then that Dine frowned. He realized that he was greatly triggered by the child Ixis. What was that? Why did I fight with that kid? Dine rubbed his chin. He had been around kids many times and often enjoyed teasing kids and getting teased. The group of kids he rescued in the Philippines were close to his heart, after all. And yet, for some strange reason, 
Dine got angry at the words of that kid. Is it because I'm young? No a broken bar strafe said that I only should have the body of a kid. What's going on? Dine wondered. It was then that the hunters around him gave him a curious stare at his sudden silence. Er, anyway, we now have a Gabu Gabu hunter who can help us. And as long as he can kill more Gabu Gabu and devour more of them, he'd also grow stronger. And we can even not kill some of the Gabu Gabu we face. I can talk with them and convince them to join our village. They would see Bertugo and think that a harmonious relationship is possible. Dine explained. The expressions of various hunters lit up. He's right, Elder, Juno, Val, is it true? The three in question glanced at each other. That does seem possible. Val nodded. We have seen Cirrus and monsters fighting each other. To think that the mist is creating such an event. If communicating with the Gabu Gabu is possible, we should try it, Juno recommended. It is as you say, normally, we shouldn't make deals with monsters. But now that we are in this situation, an alliance could be helpful. We can limit the areas we hunt and tell them to hunt on specific areas, the elder realized. The village began to talk louder. Although the older hunters kept on pressing the town to keep quiet, there was still some rejoicing that echoed around the city. As for Dine, he gave the elder a meaningful look and smiled. Good. All that's left is to make these people pray to the Genesis tree. Dine smiled as he could see his plans unfolding perfectly. Chapter 14 Dine's Fake Past 1. The night continued on with various celebratory remarks. Various children even moved near Bertugo and quietly observed him from a distance. The feeling that Bertugo had long lost somehow returned. He had told Dine of how another tribe devoured his village with several strong Gabu Gobas. This had happened shortly after the mist came when Bertugo's tribe was attacked by a maverick squad of Cirrus and some Saru human bear. As such, he had been living with a few survivors, but they slowly dwindled over time until he became the only survivor, so he lived his life as a scavenger from the hunts of the other Gabu Gabu. But now, he was in an all-human village. And the ironic thing was that the humans his race had hated for so long were curiously looking at him. The warrior Tetsu even approached the Gabu Gabu and gave him meat to eat. The small acts of kindness caused the long and wearied monster to actually cry. He had been living hell outside. And now, among his enemies, he ate and enjoyed and even relaxed. As for Dine, he excused himself for a bit and walked towards the Genesis tree. Upon entering the garden, he saw the young Vaughn praying so fervently at the Genesis tree. You're Vaughn, right? Val's kid, Dine asked. Vaughn was startled and glanced at Dine and gave a smile in return. Yes. Vaughn gave his simple answer. You look strong. Dine laughed. And he wasn't merely complimenting Vaughn. The boy had muscles for his young age. Vaughn smiled and didn't answer. I plan to train with Master Tetsu after this. I guess we'll be fellow disciples then. Dine laughed. Vaughn smiled and glanced at the Genesis tree and then to Dine. Thank you for giving the village hope. Vaughn said and bowed to leave. His smile was genuine, and Dine could really see how grateful Vaughn was. Although he was trying to hold it in, it's watching you, you know. The Genesis tree that is. I told the village earlier that they should keep praying to the tree. To be honest. I think that I am an answer from the prayers you made to this Genesis tree. Dine laughed. Vaughn smiled and bowed once more. I will surely remember those words. Vaughn bowed and left. Dine smiled and watched Vaughn go. Grow stronger. Vaughn, I need you in that world. Dine sighed as Vaughn disappeared. Hey, Meta, I need your help. One of your slumbering friends will probably die soon. And another Genesis tree is also dying. What can I do to save it? Dine touched the Genesis tree and slowly whispered. Dine was quiet and waited for a while. Are you still too weak? I'll do my best to help you recover your strength. I'll try to make the villagers pray twice more Genesis and increase their faith in you. Dine had known through the game that prayers were something that could strengthen a Rosaru. Even Meta was too weak to awaken the Genesis tree of Rimelm and needed everyone's prayers. But at the same time, he knew that prayers could only do so much and could not awaken a Genesis tree. The Kingdom of Drake, just northwest of where Rimelm was had summoned all of its citizens to try to pray at the Genesis tree. Dine wasn't sure if Terra was still there or if he had awakened before or after that event. But if a kingdom's desperate prayer could not do it, 
then the small population of Rim Elm also wouldn't be able to do it. I know you've been looking after Vaughn for so long. Continue to do so. You and he are a perfect match. Dine continued his monologue. I am someone who has served under the teachings of the Prophet Hari and have learned of various prophecies. One of the predictions involves the death of a Genesis tree and a dark shadow that will affect even the Sarukai world. It will involve the death of another Rasuru. I hope you awaken soon. Dine waited for a while, since nothing had happened. He left the tree. As he moved up the area, Tetsu was waiting for him. I see you are a religious person, just like Vaughn. Tetsu laughed. Wise words from a monk. Dine laughed. For a child, you sure have a very mature way of behaving. The horrors of the world force me to. Dine sighed. I want to talk with the elder, and probably talk with Val or Juno or the head hunters. Dine's expression turned serious. It was then that Tetsu noticed the seriousness in his eyes. I will send word right away. You should be there as well. It pertains to Byron Monastery. Dine sighed. Byron Monastery. Tetsu's expression changed. Dine went ahead and went uphill to wait at the elder's house. Soon the elder arrived along with the top hunters. All right. I wanted to tell you about the situation because I know the secrets of the mist. Dine explained. He had already prepared a long lie to tell the elders. These lies would solve the current situation as well as the mysteries of the mist. Dine knew how the mist was created and who made it, and even how to stop it. Looking at the grim state of Legai and recalling strafe warnings that this world would be harsher, Dine realized he had to make the hunters prepare. He dared not underestimate just how hard Strafe made this game far difficult, and since the workings of fate that Strafe designed have already ended, who knows if the enemy would discover Rim Elm earlier. But to protect the continuity of the game, he decided only to tell the hunters what they needed to know to prepare for the coming battles. Everyone's expression was startled. What do you know about the mist, the cause, the area, the enemy? I have seen through it in my eyes. I didn't want everyone to panic and wanted to give this village more hope. But the truth is, there could be problems in the near future. The mist, Dine had a thorough knowledge of the game. With Strafe adding this memory, Dine understood the whole picture of the mist. Yes, the mist appeared seven years ago, right? Dine asked. Yes, the cause of this mist is human made, someone created it. I was at Saw back then, during those times. Saul in the Conquerim Kingdom had a war. I'm sure you've heard of this. We have received news of it. But since it was so distant, it didn't affect us. The elder nodded. All right, let me explain what had happened. We were winning. But then, Conquerim released a different kind of weapon. It drove Osiris insane and made them more powerful than ever. It possessed the humans who had it, making them transform into a possessed creature. The mist. Juno realized what Dine was saying. Tetsu nodded. It's a weapon? Yes, it was the mist. It makes Cirrus stronger than they are. Some Cirrus grow stronger because of the mist. As for its creators, we don't know who it is specifically. The king and queen of Conkrim or Conkrim itself didn't appear during the time the mist appeared. We suspected that most of them also fell into possession, much like the rest of the world. However, since they were able to make that large fort, it must be made by someone from Conkrim's royal family. Oh, my teak. I can't believe that humans make the mist. Do not underestimate the wisdom of man. In Saul, we could also do amazing things with the Cirrus we have. How do you think we drove away from the monster kings? Dine laughed. Monster kings? The hunters looked at each other in confusion. It is an old tale. It is said that before the arrival of the Suru, monster kings reigned in Legaia. When the Cirrus arrived, they despised the monsters for monsters would eat them. When a monster devours Cirrus, they have a possibility of evolving, the elder explained. Monsters can evolve? The hunters were shocked. Yes, but it is complicated. As you can see, the mist has caused the Cirrus to run amok. They have formed groups, and the area in Drake Castle has turned into a den of Cirrus where countless gimmards have made their kingdom out of it. Not to mention the mist have haunted the spirits of the dead, causing foul ghosts and skeletons to rise in their wake. This is why monsters patrol around Drake Castle of Hopes to find a lone Gimmerd. Dine maintained calm but was inwardly surprised. So that's why the Bertugo was chasing the Gimmerd. It was his ticket to growth. Dine pondered and even considered gifting the Gimmerd back to Bertugo. The mist. Can make undead monsters? Dine asked curiously. You don't know? 
The elder was stunned. I don't. Let me clarify something. Now, you may be wondering how I remember this if I was so young. The truth is, I was possessed in the mist, the gimmard you saw earlier. And the reason I brought it here is that it has sentimental value. I was possessed in the mist for more than six years. Dine explained with a grave expression. What? The hunters were surprised. I was stunned to have learned from Bertugo that six years have passed. All the while, I felt like I was in a dream. Bertugo said that I hadn't aged a day since I was possessed. Bertugo and I lost contact with each other when the mist came. The reason I reached Drake Continent was that I was fleeing Saul. My father believed that the mist would soon envelop Paul of Caristo and send me to the Sabucus Islands through the flying train. A flying train? One of the hunters echoed out. It was Ike's father. I've heard of such mysteries. So the Sabucus Island is truly a magnificent place. Val expressed. Not when I was there. Dine revealed a complicated expression. Shortly after arrived. Rumors of a strange mist had also appeared near Reiteyu. Instead of heading for Reiteyu Kingdom, I went south and arrived here. I headed for Drake Castle but soon found that the same mist had also appeared here. It was there I separated from Bertugo. He stayed behind to fend off some of the Shuris that appeared, and I fled towards Drake Castle. After that, I don't remember much. Dine sighed. I see. I understand now. Back then. The water gate had been closed. You must have been possessed right before the water gate was opened, Juno analyzed. Dine was silent but sighed in relief. Thankfully, they filled in the void of my lies, Dine quietly thought.